Russia recently lost the biggest tank battle of the entire war in Ukraine. Could it mean the beginning of Putin's defeat? This bloody battle over the small coal mining town of Vuladar was part of the still ongoing struggle over the larger Donbass region. Vuladar lies about 40 miles southeast of the city of Donetsk, near the pre-invasion line which divided Ukraine from the self-declared Donetsk People's Republic. And since the start of the year, Vuladar has become a killing field for Russian armor, with the largest tank battle of the entire war taking place there over the span of three weeks. In that time alone, Russia lost over 130 tanks and armored vehicles, forcing Putin to rely on mass infantry assaults to try and retake the position. This was a serious blow, especially since tank warfare has been heavily mythologized in Russia since World War II and has also become symbolic of the broader conflict in Ukraine. And the Battle of Volodar showed yet again that the Russian military has some massive issues that won't be fixed anytime soon. Vuladar. Even the name itself has got a kind of Lord of the Rings dark and creepy ring to it, and with good reason. Here's why. While Vuladar has been the site of small clashes and shelling since the start of the invasion, the main battle for the town began on January 24, 2023. That night, Russia began launching assaults on Ukrainian positions, which would quickly turn into a devastating three-week siege demonstrating Russian failures. At that point, Ukraine was still waiting for sophisticated Western tanks, like the US Abrams and German Leopard 2, to arrive. Russia's replacement armor showed up earlier, but during its first deployment in Vuladar, it got absolutely decimated. Without superior firepower this time round, Ukrainians were forced to rely once again on strategy and tactics. Much of the three weeks took on the same pattern, pitched tank battles along dirt roads and tree lines, with Russians trying to thrust forward in columns and Ukrainians firing on them from hidden defensive positions. If this sounds familiar, it might be because Russia took the same terrible approach when trying to take Kyiv last year, costing them hundreds of tanks. Clearly, Russian commanders didn't learn much from that catastrophe and made exactly the same mistake this time around, advancing their unprotected tank columns into ambushes. So how did this latest embarrassment for Putin play out? Because the terrain around Vuladar is hard to defend, consisting mostly of flat, open plains and light woods, it is hardly ideal for stopping a major assault. But Ukrainians used the terrain to their advantage and applied doctrines of combined arms warfare, which Russian war planners clearly haven't picked up on. The key to Ukraine's victory in the Battle of Vuladar was in forcing Russia to fight on their terms. This meant limiting the battlefield and forcing Russian troops to attack where Ukraine wanted them to. To do so, the Ukrainian military placed hundreds of tanks and anti-personnel mines in the fields outside of Vuladar. Due to the flat landscape and lack of cover, any Russian minesweepers were immediately targeted with artillery fire. But Ukrainian troops didn't just put mines everywhere. Instead, they left clear corridors between the minefields, only large enough for two or three Russian tanks at a time to roll through. If the tanks moved at all from the cleared path, they risked having their treads blown off leaving them totally exposed to artillery strikes. But rather than try an alternate approach to get around the mines, Russian commanders made one of the most basic mistakes in all of warfare, attacking exactly where their enemy wanted them to. When Russian commanders ordered their tanks into battle along these unmined paths outside Vuladar, it left them incredibly vulnerable to the same ambushes Ukrainians have employed since the start of the invasion. Hiding in covered positions near the tank columns, Ukrainian hunter-killer teams set up anti-tank missiles on both sides of the kill zone. Without triggering the anti-tank mines, these teams were able to cross the minefields and dig themselves into strategic positions, often hiding in bushes or abandoned buildings. From there they could fire and retreat with little fear of being hit by tank fire. The main tools Ukraine employed for this stage of the ambush were the domestically produced Stugna P and the American-made Javelin, both deadly anti-tank missiles, or ATGMs. Sometimes called the Skiff, the Stugna P is a less advanced system, but can still pack a serious punch against unlucky tanks. The Stugna is somewhat clunky, weighing about 60 pounds, and relies on manual guidance, requiring its operator to maintain line of sight on the target while the missile is still in flight. But even with these limitations, the Stugna has shown it can be deadly, with a range of up to 3 miles and tandem high-explosive anti-tank or high-explosive fragmentary warheads 
capable of penetrating modern composite tank armor. The Javelin has proven to be even more successful at obliterating Russian tanks. Manufactured by American defense giants Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, the Javelin has an effective range of more than 8,000 feet and employs a fire-and-forget targeting system, allowing its operator to flee to safety after firing. Once in flight, the Javelin's missile locks onto the infrared signature of its target and flies in one of two flight modes, top attack or direct attack. While its direct attack mode is similar to the Stugner, the Javelin's top attack mode has proven to be the most deadly against Russian tanks. In this configuration, the missile travels in a high arc, coming down on the top of the least protected section of the tank, just above its barrel. Like the Stugner, the Javelin also features a tandem warhead charge, using a smaller initial blast to penetrate hundreds of millimeters of armor, while the second charge creates a cone of superplastically deformed metal, which can shred the inside of a tank like paper. Both of these ATGM systems were put to good use outside of Vuladar. Among these responsible was Lieutenant Vladislav Bayek, the deputy commander of Ukraine's 1st Mechanized Battalion of the 72nd Brigade, which inflicted much of the damage on Russian armor. Working out of a bunker in Vuladar, Lieutenant Bayek used a drone to spot the first column of 15 Russian tanks and armored personnel vehicles. We were ready, he said. We knew something like this would happen. The Russian officers, meanwhile, clearly did not. Lieutenant Bayak waited until the tanks were strung out between the mined fields before ordering a lightning ambush with the command to battle. Stugner and Javelin operators hiding in the tree lines along the fields opened fire, as did hidden artillery positions further from the road, using American M777 and French Caesar howitzers. Each team was assigned a different section of the Russian column to fire on, focusing on the front and back vehicles first to create a bottleneck. The result was devastating. Tanks in the column attempted to turn and escape the ambush, only to blow up on the mine-laden shoulder of the road. In turn, each destroyed vehicle made it harder for the rest of the column to escape, with blown-up vehicles forming their own roadblock. At that point, Ukrainian artillery would open fire on the trapped tanks, killing the Russians who tried to flee from their trapped vehicles. It ended in obliteration. For three weeks, this pattern repeated itself with Russia losing more and more tanks and, incredibly, refusing to change tactics. At one point, Russian tanks became so stuck that Ukrainians were even able to call in a strike by a HIMARS rocket system, usually only effective against stationary targets like ammunition depots. Ukraine also made excellent use of its own older tanks as well. Because they couldn't outgun the Russian armor head-on, Ukrainians dug their tanks into hidden defensive positions. Some were concealed with bushes and camouflage netting, while others were actually buried in the soil, leaving only their turrets. While not effective against top-attack munitions, these dug-in defensive positions dramatically increased the survivability of Ukraine's tanks from head on fire. And because Ukrainians knew exactly where the Russian tank columns would advance, they were able to range the entire approach for their hidden tanks and artillery. This allowed them to make strikes onto predetermined firing points with high levels of accuracy and not waste their limited ammunition. During each ambush, Ukrainian tank crews also used a range of extremely clever tactics to problem-solve and avoid having their positions detected. The tanks couldn't wait with their engines turned on without giving themselves away through thermal signature or engine noise, but needed to stay warm to be quickly fired up for combat. So Ukrainians placed kerosene-burning heaters next to their engines to keep the tanks ready to go on a moment's notice. Similarly, their hidden positions meant that many Ukrainian tank crews did not have a line of sight to their targets, so they improvised by using drone operators to sight in their attacks. This also added an extra level of confusion for the already bewildered Russian forces, as their front lines were pummeled with unseen tank fire. Their own tanks couldn't locate where to return fire, leaving them essentially blind and helpless. If the Russian columns managed to escape the mines, ATGMs, artillery, and hidden tank positions, Ukraine just used drones to shift their firing positions to fleeing troops and vehicles. And for any tanks that actually managed to retreat back through the kill zone, Ukraine had yet another deadly surprise waiting. In one of its recent shipments of military aid, the United States supplied Ukraine with up to 10,000 specially modified 155mm artillery shells, each filled with nine individual anti-tank mines and a magnetic detonator. Known as Remote Anti-Armor Mine Systems, or RAMs, 
These terrifying weapons were used to mop up any surviving Russian tanks. When a fleeing column would exit the rear of the kill zone, another group of hidden Ukrainian gunners opened fire on their rear, once again trapping them with a rain of anti-tank mines. By employing this strategy again and again against Russians who refused to try other approaches, you can see how Ukrainian defenders destroyed over 100 tanks and armored vehicles in a matter of weeks around Volodar. After a few successful ambushes, it also became clear to Ukrainian commanders that the Russians are running out of experienced tank crews and commanders alike. One Russian tank commander captured outside of Volodar turned out to be a medic who had been given a brief crash course and then sent to the front lines. Because successfully operating even an older tank takes several months of specialized training, there was little chance that the former medic would do anything but get himself killed or captured. And this wasn't a one-off, but a repeating pattern, with almost every Russian officer captured near Volodar having little to no experience in battle. And incredibly, the tank crews these officers were commanding appeared to be even greener. Most were made up of recent conscripts who had, at best, a passing familiarity with whatever vehicle they were operating. This astonishing lack of qualified personnel, while far from surprising, is yet another sign that the Russian war effort is falling apart. Russia lost nearly all of its experienced tank crews during the spring of 2022, during the disastrous assault on Kyiv. The limited number who survived those early ambushes were sent back to the east of the country as Putin limited his war effort. But those survivors were once again decimated during the wildly successful Ukrainian counteroffensive last fall. During that period, the most elite of Russia's remaining tank units, the First Guards Tank Army, was nearly destroyed outside the northern city of Liman. This was the best trained and equipped Russian tank force operating in Ukraine and was supposed to easily hold captured territory. Considering that even this elite unit was not up to the task, it's no surprise that the green Russian troops sent to Volodar have fared so badly. This is a sharp contrast with Ukrainian forces, many of whom were green and terrified when they were drafted or volunteered to defend their country last February. Even though many of those defending Volodar were relatively recent recruits, they learned on the go and didn't make the same mistake twice. Most of Ukraine's most experienced tank crews are currently elsewhere in Eastern Europe, learning to operate the advanced Leopard 2 and M1 Abrams tanks. Yet even the relatively untested troops defending Volodar were able to pull off another staggering victory. This is a pretty clear indication that the war has decisively turned in Ukraine's favor, both in terms of equipment and personnel. It's also yet another reminder of just how poor Russian military doctrine and planning is turning out to be, as neither field officers nor top military brass seem able to learn from past mistakes. Part of this difficulty likely comes from the very structure of the Russian military, which is made up of multiple, independently commanded parts. This lack of a unified command structure has plagued Russia for years and appears to be at least part of the reason why new conscripts are not warned against walking into obvious ambushes. Similarly, the seasoned troops which should theoretically be spearheading such an assault appear to be in much worse shape than expected. A recent intelligence report from the UK found that Russia sent another elite unit, the 155th Naval Infantry Brigade, into the fighting around Volodar. This force is supposed to be among the deadliest in Russia and was utilized in the largest battles last year. But the 155th suffered so many losses that even before Volodar, it was on its third personnel restaffing since the start of the war. As a result, this supposedly first-class fighting force is now staffed mostly by fresh recruits. Adding to the dysfunction is the fact that the 155th was apparently not being sent into combat together, but instead broken up into smaller units and integrated with other commands. Rather than the desired effect of boosting other units' battle readiness, the decision simply made the 155th entirely ineffective. It certainly doesn't help that Russia is rapidly running out of precision-guided munitions and other war supplies. As a result, Russian forces were unable to eliminate the Ukrainian artillery and ATGM positions before their assault on Volodar, assuming they could force their way into the town regardless. Another reason behind Russia's repeated failures in Volodar and elsewhere relates to its heavy use of private military contractors, or PMCs. The most notorious of these is the Wagner Group, headed by Putin confidant Yevgeny Prigozhin. Putin's reliance on Wagner and other groups, as well as the rampant corruption in Russia, has led to a scenario where each is directly competing for the spoils of war. Volodar is near two massive coal mines, 
one of the main reasons why Russia has spent so much time and blood trying to take the town. But since its resources would only likely be given to one PMC, there is a strong incentive to fight over spoils. So at Vuladar, the official Russian military, the Wagner Group, and the Patriot PMC, controlled directly by Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, have all been competing to make the town their own. As a consequence, none of these groups shared information over the potential ambushes, each hoping that the other would take most of the casualties, leaving them free to take over and plunder the town. Controlling the near 70 million tons of coal underneath Vuladar would make either Prigazin or Shoigu far wealthier than they currently are giving them a billion-dollar reason not to cooperate. Of course, this dynamic isn't great for an effective fighting force, and has left Russia at a significant information disadvantage. There's another political dimension to Russia's failure in Vuladar as well. It's clear to pretty much everyone but the Russians that the smart move would have been to move elsewhere and avoid the potential of mines and ambushes. Yet Russian commanders have insisted on bizarre pitched assaults, possibly because of Putin's desperate need for a political win. Anywhere Russian forces have been ground to a halt, the political importance of not appearing to lose a battle has come to outweigh the strategic importance of withdrawing and maneuvering around static defenses. Doing so would be yet another signal of weakness, especially to Putin's most hardline supporters of the invasion. But even so, after the staggering loss at Vuladar, cracks are starting to show. Russian military bloggers a vocally pro-war group have fiercely criticized the endless failed tank assaults. Grey Zone, a telegram channel close to the Wagner Group, posted in early March that relatives of the dead are inclined almost to murder and blood revenge against the general who was in charge at Vuladar. And while the Ukrainian armed forces can be glad of Russia's staggering incompetence, we should never forget the terrible price paid by places like Vuladar. By the end of the Russian assault in February, the town's deputy mayor stated that Vuladar was destroyed, with 100% of the buildings damaged. Of the town's original population of 15,000, less than 500 remain, mostly squatting in ruins and collecting rainwater to drink. While there is no doubt that the battle was a tactical victory for Ukraine, it will also take many, many years before anything can be rebuilt. In any case, it is more than clear that the war's trajectory has changed in Ukraine's favor, and that Russia cannot suffer too many more defeats like this one. But what do you think? Was Vuladar a turning point in the war? And will Russia's repeated failures eventually doom Putin's ambitions? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. After defeating Russia's attempt to take its capital, Ukraine stunned the world again in the summer and fall of 2022, when its armed forces rapidly liberated thousands of square kilometers of territory from the Russian invaders. The twin offensives in the north and south essentially lifted the threat to Kharkiv, the second largest city in Ukraine, and freed Kherson from Russian occupation that November. The rapid progress of Ukraine's offensives left the world eagerly anticipating when and where it would strike in 2023, as Russia ground itself to a halt in the struggle for the city of Bakhmut in the Donetsk Oblast. The city eventually fell, but Ukraine launched its highly anticipated offensive soon thereafter. The offensive attacked along toward Bakhmut, but the operation in Zaporizhia Oblast was much more important. This offensive aimed to reach the Sea of Azov and cut the Russian land bridge to Crimea. Unfortunately, the 2023 offensive did not prove as effective as 22's campaign. Ukrainian forces ground forward, but only slowly, as Russian minefields and fortifications proved large obstacles. The much-hoped-for breakthrough from Ukraine and its allies seemed like it would not materialize, and with the muddy season rapidly approaching, the campaign could only be called a modest success. Russia seemed to adapt to Ukraine's successes from 2022. For example, the Russian army put its supply hubs and command and control centers further back from the front line to protect them from HIMARS attacks. This and other adaptations turned the 2023 campaign into one of attrition, which the Russian army was much better suited to. Despite the arrival of Western main battle tanks like the German Leopard and American Abrams, and the use of cluster bombs by the Ukrainians starting in July, no major change to the war's status seemed to occur. Do the Ukrainians have a chance to achieve a breakthrough before the end of the campaigning season? They might. But why, up until recently, has the 2023 campaign been less than stellar so far? And how might Ukraine be able to turn the situation around? Let's take a look at where the Ukrainians were at the start of the offensive, where they are now, 
and the dangers that still await them. After the Ukrainian successes of 2022, which ended with the recapture of Kherson, winter settled in, the offensive ground to a halt, and Russia used the opportunity to lick its wounds. At the time, most of the world's attention was riveted on Soledar and Bakhmut, which Russia sought to capture at the cost of tens of thousands of casualties. Meanwhile, Russia was also building the most extensive and elaborate network of fortifications seen in Europe since World War I, and arguably the most formidable in the world outside the demilitarized zone across the Korean peninsula. This was especially the case in the Zaporizhia Oblast. This was a vital area to protect, as Ukrainian successes there would cut the Russian army's land bridge to Crimea. That would be a strategic disaster for Russia, as the peninsula is one of its army's most important supply hubs. It would also endanger Vladimir Putin's hold on power, as he promoted the annexation of Crimea in 2014 as one of his greatest achievements. It's hard to see how he would survive losing the war in Ukraine and losing control over Crimea. As early as December 2022, it became apparent that Russia was fortifying the area to protect the axis to Crimea. Late that month, Russian forces began to turn the city of Melitopol in Zaporizhia Oblast into a heavily armed fortress. The Russian army concentrated troops in the vicinity and built a network of dragon's teeth covering the entire city, according to Ivan Fedorov, the mayor of the occupied city. Melitopol sits on a major road network in the area and is only about 100 kilometers northeast of Crimea. It was also clear at the end of 2022 that the Russian forces were digging in around the city of Tokmak, another key transit hub in the Zaporizhia Oblast, further north of Melitopol. The Russian army was surrounding the city with a network of trenches and fortifications. As winter settled in over the front and the bulk of the fighting took place around Bakhmut, Russia continued to improve on this network of fortifications. Ukraine's Western allies did not help matters, as they dithered over the delivery of weapons the Ukrainian military had been asking for, such as tanks and longer-range missiles like the American ATAC-Ms. Satellite images taken of the fortifications in Zaporizhia Oblast early in 2023 show deep lines of trenches, personnel positions, rows of dragon's teeth barriers to impede the movement of tanks, and well-sighted artillery placements. By the middle of April 2023, the United Kingdom's Ministry of Defense reported that the Russians had completed a defense in depth of three layers, covering approximately 120 kilometers in length. The first layer was a front line of forward combat positions to weaken an initial Ukrainian attack. The second and third lines of defense were more elaborate and came about 10 to 20 kilometers behind the preceding lines. The fortifications were likely the responsibility of the Russian Southern Grouping of Forces (SGF). As Russia became convinced that an offensive toward Melitopol was coming, it fortified the entire axis of attack to that city. The UK MOD said on April 12th that these fortifications could prove a significant obstacle, but their utility depended on whether the SGF could support them with sufficient manpower and artillery, and it was not sure if it had the capacity to muster such resources. In total, war watchers had described a vast defensive network stretching from Melitopol, with defensive lines encircling Tokmak and the city of Vasilivka, and eastward onward to Poloi by the middle of April 2023. The Zaporizhia defenses also include minefields in front of and between the main lines, and anti-tank ditches that require engineering equipment to plug. The fortifications in Zaporizhia came a few kilometers behind the front lines and were interlinked with a network stretching through the entire Russian-occupied territories of Ukraine. The Russian forces were also heavily fortifying northern Crimea. This would seem odd because Crimea is well behind the front lines, but for the Russians, there can be no risk of losing the peninsula and they will protect it in almost any way they can. Western observers hoped the Ukrainians would be able to succeed in the coming offensive by using the tanks they were now receiving to exploit breakthroughs and open gaps for further attacks. However, the delay in the arrival of these tanks would not help this plan. Ukraine needed to wait for a sufficient number of its new assets to arrive, as crews trained on several different tank models. This delay gave the Russians time to dig in even deeper. The first line of defense eventually became the strongest of the three. Ukraine's offensive in Zaporizhia Oblast finally began in early June, later than many analysts had expected. As the world's attention was fixed on the destruction of the Novokokovka Dam on the Dnipro River days earlier, Ukrainian forces attacked south of the town of Orykiv, toward occupied Tokmak in the western part of the oblast. However, it became clear early on that the offensive was going slower than expected. 
President Zelensky acknowledged this at the time, but insisted that he would not cut corners and play with the lives of his country's troops. By the end of August, Ukraine had liberated the village of Robotyne, which is approximately 15 kilometers south of Orykiv and 23 kilometers north of Tokmak. This was a sign of the attritional nature of the campaign. Ukrainian forces were making stunning advances a year earlier, but now they were grinding south very slowly over months, and Russian minefields, artillery, anti-tank obstacles, and even tunnels were making the Ukrainian troops pay dearly for the land that they took. Russian helicopters had also been active, providing the ground forces with the close air support they had often lacked before that point. The Russians counterattacked at Robotyne on September 6, but were beaten back. As of late October, Tokmak has still not been taken, much less Melitopol. While the Zaporizhia offensive got the most attention because it was the most important, Ukraine was active in other sectors as well. It conducted counterattacks around the captured city of Bakhmut, staged some operations around the Kherson front where it even managed to establish a beachhead on the opposite side of the Dnipro, and applied pressure throughout the entire front line, using infantry companies to attack in constant low-level sorties. Ukraine's Western allies were not entirely pleased with this strategy and pressured the Ukrainians to concentrate their forces on one or two centers of advance. However, for the Ukrainians, this play has had a few advantages. First, it pins down other Russian forces and prevents them from reinforcing the sectors that Ukraine is most interested in. Russia has been mostly on the defensive since the capture of Bakhmut in May and has only recently begun offensive operations in Avdivka in Donetsk Oblast. But Russian military bloggers are divided on the success of this attack, and they have complained that the Ukrainian drones have made armored assaults costly. Meanwhile, Ukrainian minefields are obstructing further advances in the area, a reality that has shades of the difficulties Ukraine has faced in the Zaporizhia offensive. Ukrainian sources have stated that Russia continues to transfer forces to the Avdivka sector, indicating that its attacks may not yet be over. Overall, Ukraine's strategy to pin the Russian forces down all across the front while it continues its assault into Zaporizhia might be finally paying off. Despite the overall disappointment in the offensive, Ukraine achieved something important at the end of September. It had broken through the Sorovakin Line, named after the general who was its architect. The Sorovakin Line is the first and strongest of the Russian defensive lines in the Zaporizhia Oblast. But how did Ukraine manage this breakthrough after many months of seemingly grinding forward with no result? It learned from its bitter experience in the early days of the counteroffensive. For example, Ukraine stopped using artillery to directly support its infantry assaults. That wasn't exactly good news for those units, since the lack of fire support to pin enemy defenders down would have made them much more vulnerable. There was a catch, though. Ukraine waited for Russian artillery to shoot first. Then it used its Western-supplied counter-battery radars to fire back, enacting precision strikes on the Russian artillery positions and destroying their guns. The Ukrainians proved so effective at this that related complaints quickly spread around Russian social media sites. The loss of fire support made the Russian units, even those well dug in, vulnerable. After breaching the Sorovakin line, Ukraine did not continue to advance to the south directly and ran straight into the teeth of the second line of defense. Instead, Ukrainian units turned to the east and struck around the village of Verbov. The presence of Ukrainian troops in the area confirmed that they had indeed achieved the breakthrough of the first line. From there, Ukrainian troops attacked the second defensive line in a place the Russians did not expect. On September 22nd, the Ukrainians broke into the city. Later, geolocated footage confirmed that Ukrainian troops were operating behind Russia's second defensive line in the Zaporizhia Oblast. However, about a month later, there is no news that the village has been recaptured from the Russians. Still, it is the most rapid progress made since the start of the Zaporizhia campaign. As of October 24th, Ukraine was also making advances toward the villages of Kopani and Novoprokopivka. Russian military bloggers claim that counterattacks are taking place near Vabov and Robotyne, but the situation is muggy, which is actually good news for Ukraine. That information is rapidly changing amid a confused picture indicates that the action in Zaporizhia is fluid and that operations are no longer static assaults against heavily fortified Russian positions. One has been confirmed. Ukrainian forces have gotten behind a regiment's worth of some of Russia's most elite paratroopers, the VDV Airborne Forces. These troops were called in from the north of Ukraine to reinforce the fortifications in Zaporizhia. Again, this is good news for Ukraine, because it indicates that Russia is worried that its defenses will crack. There are fears among Russian military bloggers that this elite unit will be encircled and destroyed by Ukrainian forces in the area. 
Are these units being sacrificed to slow the Ukrainian advance as winter rapidly approaches? That would not be out of the question. The VDV units have suffered heavy casualties since the start of the invasion, as the Russian military has often used these units improperly. According to the commander of this force, Colonel General Mikhail Toplinsky, at least 8,500 of these paratroopers have been wounded in action since the war began, and a few days later, the UK Ministry of Defense assessed that at least half of the 30,000 paratroopers dispatched to Ukraine had become casualties. These casualties have since been replaced by troops that are far from elite in character. Now these paratroopers are airborne in name only, as they have been intermingled with regular motorized rifle brigades to defend the line in Zaporizhia. Meanwhile, Ukraine has several armored brigades equipped with the western main battle tanks it received early in the year, waiting in reserve in the area, poised to exploit a breakthrough. If these tanks can widen the gaps the infantry opens for them, the Russian forces manning the defenses in Zaporizhia may find themselves encircled. If such a thing were to occur, the road to Tokmak would be open. If Tokmak falls, the Russian land bridge to Crimea would be in serious danger, as it is an important logistics hub in the area. It would be an excellent staging point for a Ukrainian advance to the Sea of Azov, which, if completed, would split the Russian forces occupying Ukraine in two and trap a sizable amount of Russia's total military power in a giant pocket between Crimea, the eastern part of Kherson Oblast, and the Ukrainian front lines in Zaporizhia. The success of such an operation would open Crimea itself to a siege in the coming campaign. Ukraine has anticipated a Russian retreat to Crimea. That is why it's launched precision strikes against key targets there, like military bases, landing ships, and even submarines. One of the targets was the headquarters of Russia's Black Sea Fleet at Sevastopol, which was once thought to have killed the fleet's commander, although that particular claim was subsequently debunked. Ukraine has also carried out special operations against Russia's S-400 air defense systems stationed in Crimea, which resulted in Russia losing three out of five batteries there. The attacks in Crimea have even further eroded the combat effectiveness of the Black Sea Fleet, which had launched frequent missile strikes into Ukraine despite being docked for most of the war. With that becoming less of an option, Russia may need to use its air force much more than it has to make up for the shortfall in firepower. With F-16s armed with long-range air-to-air missiles soon set to arrive in Ukraine, that is not an exciting prospect for Russia either. There's also grim news for Russia on the ground. After many months of wavering, the Biden administration finally approved Ukraine's request for ATAC-M's missiles as the summer ended. These ground-based ballistic missiles have a range of 300 kilometers, and their arrival has now put all of Russia's bases in Ukrainian territory within range of HIMARS. Ukraine demonstrated Russia's new danger when it fired its ATAC-M's missiles, which were armed with cluster munitions, for the first time on October 17. The attacks, which came in the cities of Berdyansk and Luhansk, targeted Russian airfields. In addition to the heavy damage to the infrastructure, the ATAC-M's missiles and their set of 1,000 separate submunitions destroyed up to 21 enemy helicopters. It was the biggest blow to the Russian Air Force in the war. Meanwhile, dozens of Russian troops were killed or wounded in the operation. This was the result of using just three ATAC-M's missiles. The attack clearly struck a nerve with Putin. When speaking to reporters in Beijing amidst his attendance of China's Belt and Road Forum on October 18, Putin singled out ATAC-M's in particular. If Russia has lost the war, why do they, the United States, supply ATAC-M's? Let's take them back and all the other weapons. Biden can take a seat and eat pancakes and visit us for some tea. If the war is lost, what are we talking about? Why ATAC-M's? Ask him that. It's funny. Firstly, this of course causes harm and creates an additional threat. Secondly, we will of course be able to repel these attacks. War is war and of course they pose a threat, that goes without saying. But most importantly, this will not change the situation of the line of contact dramatically at all. It just prolongs the agony. Some commentators found this quotation interesting as they believe it was the first time Putin referred to his so-called special military operation in Ukraine as a war, but the Russian dictator was quoting Biden for that part of the message. What is more important was Putin's defensiveness about the ATAC-M's missiles. He knows the threat that they pose to his army in Ukraine, and their arrival means the options are narrowing. With the arrival of ATAC-M's and F-16s, Ukraine now has almost all of the weapons it requested since the start of the war. The traditional campaigning season may be drawing to a close, but Ukraine is also making plans to continue its offensive into the winter months, learning the lessons from last year. 
so although the attack through Zaporizhia in the summer and into the fall was far slower than many hoped for, Ukraine now has the momentum and the tools to affect the much-desired breakthrough if it handles its operations properly. For Ukraine, the biggest danger is now not military in nature, but political. The slow pace of the Zaporizhia offensive has emboldened the critics of aid to Ukraine, especially in the United States, which has just been through a period of congressional chaos where rogue members of the narrow Republican majority voted to oust their own speaker. As a result, the US House of Representatives could not do its business for three weeks. Aid to Ukraine has been a topic of heated division within the Republican Party's ranks, and the United States is about to enter a presidential election, where assistance to Kyiv will be a notable issue. Joe Biden is unpopular at home, and it's unknown what the Republican nominee's position on the issue will be. If Ukraine seeks to avoid the loss of the American support it needs to win the war, it must continue to demonstrate the capability of making serious gains on the battlefield. Its performance on the battlefield in the coming months could prove decisive to its viability. Its military capability is there, but will the United States commit to it for the long term? All eyes will be watching how the results on the battlefields of Ukraine interact with America's chaotic partisan politics of 2024. But what do you think? Is Ukraine close to a breakthrough in the Zaporizhia Oblast? Will it soon cut the Russian land bridge to Crimea? How will domestic American politics affect the coming year in the war? Be sure to let us know what you think in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. If you queued up a generic video entitled Epic Russian Army Fails before February 2022, you might have expected to find humorous compilations of drunk Russian soldiers playing harmless pranks on one another, mishandling live grenades, or marching comically out of lockstep. To tell the truth, it might not have been all that different from your standard epic US Army Fails compilation. But times have changed, and since Russia's 2022 full-scale invasion of Ukraine, its military has chalked up an impressive list of tactical, operational, and strategic failures which have attrited their once-feared invasion force beyond comprehension. Cataloging a comprehensive list of these failures is impossible. The YouTube compilation video would rival the length of any Greek tragedy or comedy, depending on your perspective. Still, we have tried to come up with a list of major shortcomings which have had the most significant bearing on the conflict's outcome. Here are six major military failures committed by Russia in the war against Ukraine since the 2022 invasion. Number 1. The failure to capitalize on the capture of Hostomel Airport From the start of its unlawful invasion, Russia's hopes rested on the premise that its armed forces could rapidly encircle Kyiv, decapitate its political leadership, install a pro-Russian regime, and place itself in a strong position for negotiations. The quicker this happened, the less time Russia would afford the West to unite and intervene, and with hindsight, we know this mattered. A lot. Ultimately, speed, precision, and grit were the difference between the conflict becoming Russia's version of the Gulf War or Passchendaele with drones. It's no secret that Putin's plan went spectacularly awry. The cornerstone of the invasion was, in fact, the Hostomel Airport, a key military airfield and logistical hub with one of the longest runways in Eastern Europe, just 10 kilometers northwest of Kyiv. The battle for Hostomel lasted less than 36 hours was the first major battle of the Russo-Ukrainian war and a decisive event in the war, and was a perfect example of how a tactical setback can snowball into operational stagnation. The plan was simple, conceived as a traditional airfield envelopment and seizure, followed by the insertion of elite airborne battalions in transport planes. Once on the ground, Russia's airborne troops would secure the city, overthrowing, assassinating, or forcing Zelensky's cabinet into exile. Putin truly believed Zelensky's government would capitulate in three to four days, the first of his many strategic blunders. In this, he severely underestimated Ukrainian resolve. There was plenty of risk in the Hostomel plan. It wasn't a traditional combined arms operation targeting Ukraine's armed forces in the field. It was a political coup de main, a surgical attack which sought to avoid a large, publicly shocking set-piece battle. Ancillary thrusts elsewhere across the country were designed in part to paralyze Ukraine's armed forces and spread them thin, maximizing Russia's chances. Russia had already tried a number of these high-risk, high-reward strategies in the past, with mixed results. It happened in Czechoslovakia in 1968, in Afghanistan in 1979, 
in Kosovo in 1999 and in Crimea in 2014. According to a group of Western Soviet experts, if anything, the attempt on Hostomel was stereotypical of prior regime change operations, equally reminiscent of their failed attempt to secure Grozny in 1994, when a multi-prong assault into the heart of the city went badly during the First Chechen War. Russia likes shock and awe, and to achieve regime change, it follows a somewhat predictable blueprint. Seize the capital's biggest airport, funnel in elite airborne forces, decapitate the political leadership, and prime the broader operational effort. The crazy thing is that Russia had all sorts of infiltrators in place across Kyiv prior to the attack. For months, saboteurs and spies tasked with enabling the Russian advance into the city went about funneling intelligence back to Moscow, marking landing zones, securing infrastructure, and more. Their efforts achieved little. Incredibly, in the same way many Russian soldiers were surprised that their initial deployment along the border, on exercise, had transitioned to a complex scheme for a large-scale invasion involving tight timetables and numerous axes of attack, many of Russia's saboteurs were likewise fuzzy on the details of Putin's plan. Fortunately, Ukrainian intelligence and police officers uncovered and arrested most of these infiltrators before the invasion truly had kicked off. On the morning of February 24th, the assault commenced as an aerial convoy of around 34 Mi-8 HIP transport helicopters and dozens of Ka-52 Alligator and older Mi-24 attack helicopters advanced along the infiltration corridor into Kyiv's airspace. The 200-300 VDV paratroopers securing the airport expected minimal resistance. They were inserted at the southern tip of the airfield, while attack helicopters raked stationary defenses to the north. Ukrainian Major Vitaly Rudenko, commander of the small garrison of National Guard forces defending the site, was apparently unaware of the approaching helicopters until he heard the chopping of the helicopter's rotor blades. His troops were ill-suited for the task, to say the least. Ukraine's 4th Rapid Reaction Brigade was a newly organized combined arms entity created along NATO standards, with infantry, tanks, artillery, and surveillance drones working in tandem. The problem for Rudenko was that his superiors had expected the weight of the attack to come in the Donbass and deployed most of the 4th Brigade heavy weapons out east. The 200 men left to defend the airfield were rear echelon forces, most of them new conscripts wielding small arms, a few older Igla manpads, and a towed AA gun. According to one expert, they were more akin to finance officers than infantry officers. Still, they did their best, with 20 of them defending the radar at the northern extreme of the airfield with the AA gun while the rest called in reinforcements and dug in to defend the airfield from the VDV in the south. Moving large vehicles onto the tarmac to prevent fixed-wing aircraft from landing, the defenders quickly shut down a Russian Ka-52 helicopter with an Igla, which boosted their morale. They would repeat this feat three more times in the next two hours as ammunition ran low. In the end, they simply couldn't hold the airfield, conducting a controlled evacuation to the outskirts of Hostomel while massing reinforcements. The Russians had prepared 1,000 reinforcements of their own they hoped to insert earlier in the day, but the helicopter losses, Ukrainian artillery fire hitting the airfield, and inability of the Russian airborne to control the surrounding vicinity forced them to abort their plan. This was, by all measures, a pivotal moment in the then nascent fight, and to this day, nobody is certain why Russia's reinforcement plan was abandoned. Russian hopes then rested on the set of advancing mechanized columns coming in from Belarus. They had only 79 miles to reach Kyiv, but as they drove through the narrow corridor through Chernobyl and Ivankiv, they encountered resistance of their own, leaving the Russian VDV isolated at Hostomel. Ukraine's military leadership recognized the importance of the moment and ordered an immediate counterattack to retake the airfield. With a motley force of older veterans, civilian volunteers, and brand new conscripts, they organized a combined arms attack which commenced at sunset on February 24th. They were grateful to discover that the Russian airborne soldiers failed to occupy good defensive positions and found it fairly easy to dislodge them. Were Russia's vaunted elite this tactically inept? One Ukrainian soldier described engaging the minimally protected Russian forces on the airfield as being like playing a video game, just shooting and knocking them down from our positions outside the airfield. By evening's end, the Ukrainians had sent the Russians airborne into retreat. It would be recaptured the next day but would never serve as the air bridge Russia needed. Thankfully, delays to the advancing Russian mechanized column from Belarus removed the element of surprise and gave Ukraine breathing space to mount a credible defense of Kyiv. Russia's haphazard attack on Hostomel seemed to have no alternative or viable plan B, 
there were plenty of weaknesses to exploit on the city's western side during the first week of that war, but Russia was bent on a direct assault from Hostomel into the city center. The failure to enact a complete encirclement of the city saw Russian units bogged down in cramped suburbs and urban environments where their advantage of mechanized mobility could be easily countered by marauding, lightly equipped squads of Ukrainian guerrillas. Consequently, the failure at Hostomel ushered in a whole host of compounding supply issues, strangled Russian lines of communication, opened up bogged down Russian convoys to ambush, and vastly bolstered not only Ukraine's morale, but Western confidence in their ability to win. More importantly, it disavowed the notion of any inherent Russian military superiority on the basis of geopolitical reputation or economic power alone. By March 25th, the Russians had withdrawn from Kyiv. By April 1st, Hostomel was cleared, dissolving any lingering Russian hopes of winning the war quickly. Number 2. Snake Island – Losing the Information War There was a lot more happening on the first day of the invasion than the seizure of Hostomel. Out on a rocky outcropping in the Black Sea known as Snake Island, a tiny garrison of 13 Ukrainian defenders were busy gaining international renown. When asked by a Russian warship waiting offshore, to lay down their weapons and surrender to avoid bloodshed and unnecessary victims, or else suffer immediate bombardment. In response, one of them, Roman Frybov, issued his famous retort to the Russian missile cruiser Moskva, Russian warship, go F yourself. The Snake Island defenders were all reported killed in action by the Ukrainian government after the audio clip of their courageous last stand went viral, but as it turned out, most of its garrison had actually lived taken into captivity as prisoners. Released one month later in a prisoner exchange back in March of 2022, Brybov was awarded a decoration of valor and, with his peers, immortalized as a hero of Ukraine. The struggle for Snake Island and the defenders' unabashed defiance quickly became a slogan in the country's fight for survival. Commemorated just a few weeks later on a national postage stamp, the episode epitomized the pluck, courage, and composure with which the Ukrainian armed forces conducted themselves in the war thus far. For many Westerners with ancestors who themselves fought for independence against despotic tyranny, the rallying cry struck a familiar chord. It was one of many instances where, almost immediately, Ukraine demonstrated it was intent on winning the information war against their enemy. While Russia has shown little aptitude for controlling or caring about the message it sends to the world, Ukraine has not lost ground in this domain ever since. Number 3. The Inability to Prevent the Sinking of the Moskva Maybe instead of targeting Snake Island, the Moskva should have picked on someone its own size. Fittingly, our next failure on the list was Russia's inability to prevent the Moskva's sinking, which was, ironically, critically damaged in an attack by Ukrainian anti-ship missiles just a few weeks after its Snake Island run-in and sank the following day on April 14, 2022. Having received intelligence and targeting data on the Moskva's whereabouts from American intelligence agencies, the Ukrainian Navy planned a strike on the flagship vessel of the Black Sea Fleet, which had, since Soviet times, intervened in conflicts from Georgia to Syria. All it took were two R-360 Neptune anti-ship missiles to start a fire large enough to cause the ship's munitions to cook off and explode. The cruiser reportedly sank in stormy seas shortly thereafter the largest Russian warship to be sunk in wartime since the end of World War II, and the first Russian flagship since Kenyaz Suvorov in 1905 during the Russo-Japanese War. Recognizing its dependence on Western support early in the war against Russia revealed Ukraine's penchant for delivering high-profile, if isolated, successes to demonstrate their competence in utilizing the inflow of military assistance. Russia tried to cover up the incident at first, claiming that the fire had been accidental and that it had been contained by Russian sailors. When the Moskva literally failed to surface on camera ever again, the Russian Ministry of Defense conceded it had sunk, this time while being towed in stormy seas. What is most eye-opening is that the Moskva had a triple-tiered air defense that could have provided an adequate chance of intercepting the incoming Neptune missiles, with three to four minutes of radar detection. In a variation on a recurring theme, it appeared that the ship's crew failed to activate these systems, including the S-300F and 9K-33 OSA surface-to-air missiles, chaff or decoys, electronic jamming, or the last-ditch AK-630 close-in weapon systems. One Turkish correspondent claimed the snafu implied a lack of crew training for such emergency scenarios. 
And that is what is so damning about the entire incident, whether it was sheer incompetence or, as another Danish military analyst surmised, operator fatigue. The fact remains that Russian sailors transformed a situation where an expensive vessel, which could have almost assuredly survived several Neptune missile strikes, with some simulations even hinting that it would take at least seven to guarantee the vessel's sinking, was sunk using only two. The Moskva, according to retired U.S. Navy captain and former director of operations at U.S. Pacific Command's Joint Intelligence Center, was perhaps the largest warship ever disabled or destroyed by a missile. Today, Russia lacks the economic or industrial capacity to easily replace such a vessel. Its loss was humiliating to Russian President Vladimir Putin, a psychological strain which demonstrated Ukraine's ability to employ sophisticated weaponry effectively, force the Russian Navy to move much of its battle group farther from the Ukrainian coastline, and further underpinned Russia's narrative of incompetence, which has proliferated after the attack. Hilariously, in April 2022, Ukraine began referring to the sunken vessel as a world-class dive site with underwater cultural heritage. Just 130 kilometers off the coast of Odessa, it can be admired without much diving, in water just 45 to 50 meters deep. Online tour offices still promote the wreck as the most interesting spot for diving in the Black Sea, with the best time to visit listed as after the Ukrainian victory over Russia. Number 4. The Failure to Achieve Air Superiority From the depths of the Black Sea, we travel to the airspace over Ukraine, where, whichever way you cut it, you've probably been left wondering the same thing as everyone else. What on earth has happened to Putin's vaunted air force? Try as they might, Russian combat aviators have failed to establish any kind of air superiority over the battlefield thus far. Part of their problem rests with technological advances made in the 1970s, which made it possible to furnish vulnerable infantry with their own portable handheld anti-aircraft missiles too. Man-portable air defense systems, or MANPADs, are simple and cost-effective shoulder-fired rockets that lock onto aircraft using infrared homing. They can be taught to new users in a matter of a few minutes. Knowing Russia's numerically superior air force would play a central role in the opening phases of its invasion of Ukraine, back in February of 22, Western nations rushed thousands of manpads into Ukrainian hands to shore up their air defenses. These included American Stinger missiles, surplus Soviet Iglers, and British laser-guided high-velocity Starstreak systems. The gamble paid off. Cheap manpads made it much harder for Russia's air force to establish aerial supremacy, imposing steep, asymmetrical costs on Russian pilots who could no longer safely approach priority targets in Ukrainian airspace. For the price of one 60 to 80,000 Igla, Ukrainian soldiers can down a $36 million Su-34 bomber or an $85 million Shukhoi Su-35S fighter. That's real bang for your buck. This has had real repercussions all over the battlefield. Modern combined arms warfare hinges on effective cooperation between all service branches – air, armor, artillery, and infantry. Because Russia has thus far been unable to provide active, continuous air cover for its ground units, tanks, logistics convoys, artillery, and infantry have been repeatedly caught out in the open and destroyed over the course of the war, a spectacle played out almost daily in combat footage littering social media for the entire world to see. This isn't to say Russian aircraft are not present over the battlefield or that Ukraine enjoys its own air superiority. Far from it. Russian aircraft make overflights every single day, but most last only a few seconds. With fighter bombers flying in pairs or groups of four, ingress to a target area at low altitude, maybe 50 meters or less, and then lob the rockets and bank left or right and return back to base. Rather than hover over the front, far slower helicopters tend to operate similarly as airborne artillery platforms, approaching the contact line, firing their salvos of unguided rockets, and departing as quickly as possible. This has made it even harder for Ukrainian infantry to shoot down Russian aircraft. Constant vigilance is required since little warning is given. Since timing is everything, concealed Ukrainians tend to target slower Su-20 fighter bombers and helicopters like the Mi-8. Hefting an 18-kilogram Igler onto your shoulder while sprinting out into the open, trying to hold it steady to get a lock while the target zips overhead, then launching the missile knowing you're in mortal danger, all within a span of 15 seconds or less, can you imagine how difficult that must be? The decentralization of air defense made possible by manpads like the Stinger has helped limit the effectiveness of Russian air power. 
but it hasn't blunted it altogether. According to former Staff Sergeant and Green Beret David Bramlett, a combat veteran who recently spent 11 months fighting the Russians in Ukraine, Russia could still turn things around if Western support wavers. Russian air superiority, he argued, would be the worst-case scenario for Ukraine at this point. If Russia can gain air superiority, it's going to be an entirely different battlefield, and the Ukrainians are going to have a very, very hard time of putting up a conventional resistance. Lucky for Ukraine, Russia also has its own incompetence to thank in part for its lack of air superiority. Recently, accidents have taken their toll on Russian aircraft, with six crashes alone registered over the span of two months in late 22. The slew of accidents reflects the toll the war has had on Russian aviation writ large. Reflecting on aerial crashes, Michael Bonnet, an engineer and analyst at RAND Corporation, noted that What's interesting is that even aircraft not involved in the Russian invasion are crashing. In an interview with Business Insider, he said that while mechanical failures are expected in aircraft over time, a rapid increase in fleet-wide mechanical failures may indicate that something fundamental has changed. So what has changed? The war has placed immeasurable strain on Russian aviation. Colossal losses early in the conflict contributed to Russia's tendency to adopt more risk-averse tactics playing a subordinate role to Russia's ground troops, according to Guy Plopsky, an Israeli defense analyst and Russian expert. In just eight months, Russian combat aviators flew an average 150 sorties a day for a total of 34,000 combat sorties. But the number of sorties has greatly diminished. From an early high of 300 per day, Britain's Ministry of Defense estimates that now Russia probably conducts tens of missions per day. Very few of those sorties actually enter Ukrainian airspace. General wear and tear can be expected in any war, but the immense toll has seriously impacted Russia's pool of 7,500 relatively inexperienced pilots, who are said to receive roughly 100 hours of flight time per year, one-third less than their NATO counterparts. The lack of training limits their ability to conduct the type of massive air campaigns Western armies almost take for granted. The lack of qualified pilots is only one part of the problem. Russia also lacks skilled mechanics or the proper tools to make and fix the parts needed to keep Russia's modernized air fleet up to snuff. The fact that the pre-war stockpiles are dilapidated and rapidly diminishing only adds to the problem as the demand for specialized parts and repair tools grows. Russia has tried to mobilize greater amounts of manpower to address the human part of the problem, which, as you can imagine, has its own issues. Just like training pilots, you have to train the repair crews to diagnose and maintain extremely complex computer avionics and technical systems. That is, if you can get them. Herein lies another problem with Russia's Air Force. While mobilization certainly affected the small and medium-sized companies that make aviation parts, the random crashes and accidents began happening prior to mobilization. The shortage of manufacturing tools was already going on, which means Western sanctions may have had a role to play. Russia has been left in an economic and industrial vice by the West, squeezed out of many of its traditional import-export markets, where it has received the critical components it needs to keep its planes airworthy. Ultimately, there's no out-and-out -out answer as to why Russia has failed to establish air superiority. It's likely that a combination of factors – wear and tear, stress on older airframes, a lack of pilots and trained air crews, and Western sanctions – have each played a significant role. What we do know is that thanks in part to their own outstanding courage, adaptability and resilience, coupled with the material support they've received from the West, Ukraine has managed to do a lot with a little in terms of its own air defense. Number 5. Russian Armor Failing in Ukraine It's been said that the only thing getting more airtime than Russia's ailing air force these days are the airborne turrets of its exploding tanks. Boy can those things fly! Russia has lost well over 2,300 tanks since it invaded Ukraine. Hundreds more have been abandoned or captured. As its armored force dwindles, it's had to pour older and older armor into the Ukrainian meat grinder. The country once touting its next-generation T-14 Armata is now sending T-62s and T-54s into battle. It's a bad look. There are many reasons for Russia's armored failures thus far. Western weapons have helped tip the scales with humble but deadly anti-tank guided missiles like the Javelin, Enlor, and AT-4 becoming symbols of Ukraine's stubborn resistance. There's other reasons too. Russia's tactical ineptitude deserves blame. 
Untrained conscripts rarely work in tandem with supporting armored units. Logistics and the lack of fuel, rations, and ammunition at forward supply dumps have wreaked havoc on Russian columns. Lastly, Western sanctions make it harder for Russia to source the specialized parts it needs to repair and maintain newer tanks. Back in November 2022, the Pentagon announced that Russia had lost half of its main battle tanks in combat. Huge losses were inflicted during the Kharkiv counteroffensive last autumn. The Russian army was reportedly losing 10 tanks per day, while the Ukrainians were losing just two. Jarring figures when you consider the Russians were defending rather than attacking. The Russians are still building tanks to replace their losses, but can they be introduced faster than current models are being destroyed? The simple answer is no. Unless they can give the American arsenal of democracy during World War II a run for its money and build dozens of tanks, trucks, and other vehicles every single day, the average rate they were being destroyed at the end of last year. No country on Earth has managed to replicate even a fraction of that type of industrial output in wartime ever since, so can we really assume Russia would be the first? No, I don't think so. Russia has thousands of old Soviet tanks in storage, including versions of the newer T-90s, T-80s, and their time-tested predecessors that make up the backbone of the Ukrainian armored force, the T-72 and the T-64. But most of the footage we've seen depicts Russian T-62s being modernized at Russian armor repair plants and shipped to the front. These tanks are nothing short of obsolete in the modern era, and have been since they started to be replaced back in 1975. Which begs the question, why are they bothering with these Cold War relics at all? A lot of it has to do with how hard it is to maintain newer tanks in storage, since they operate using more sophisticated electronic components that, as we all know, are more and more difficult to source. It seems that Russia has tried to pull bunches of T-72s, T-80s, and T-90s out of storage only to realize how expensive and difficult it might be to make them combat ready. A fair portion of these were probably mothballed to begin with, tanks left in storage without maintenance atrophy, rubber treads and wheels crack and chip, mice chew through exposed wires, armor rusts and corrodes. It's a real nightmare scenario for Russian mechanics. The humble T-62, like the T-54 before it, was mass-produced with one idea in mind. Make it simple, make it good, and make a crap ton of them. Simple designs mean fewer electronics, greater ease of repair, and interchangeability of parts. Like that old reliable 1966 Chevy you have in your shed, no matter how many years go by, you can always throw it up on the blocks, tinker with the carburetors, and get it to start right up. That's the type of tank the T-62 was. The fact Russia had something in the region of 20,000 of these in storage at the end of the Cold War means there are plenty of stocks to draw from. The bigger question is whether or not it's even worth it. Would Americans be happy if the US Army started dusting off old Vietnam vintage M60 patterns from storage, slapping on a fresh coat of paint, better comms, and a pair of thermal sights and said, go to and prosper? Of course not. But when has the Kremlin cared what its soldiers think? Repair plants across Russia are now churning out oodles of Cold War antiques. Most of these, museums on tracks, culled from deep storage, have not seen combat in decades, if at all, and their maintenance records reflect that. Some are being fitted with new engines, thermal imaging, bulkier armor, new comms, better optics, and cope cages. It probably won't be enough to protect their crews from certain destruction. Number 6. Failure to adequately prepare new recruits for combat Speaking of Putin's indifference for his countrymen, our next failure revolves around the inability of the Russian government and military to adequately train and outfit their recruits for combat. In the war's first year, Ukraine reversed its dire position and engineered dual counteroffensives, which achieved success beyond most people's wildest imagination. In just over eight months, Russia has lost somewhere in the region of 90,000 irrecoverably wounded, lost, or killed soldiers a number that has by now far eclipsed the total casualties the Soviet Union sustained during nine years of brutal combat in Afghanistan between 1979 and 1989. Notably, Putin lost more soldiers in a week than the United States lost in 20 years in Afghanistan. Putin reacted by announcing sweeping calls to mobilize new recruits for frontline service. This created chaos in a country which had, until then, been relatively insulated from the realities of the conflict. Many military-age draftees did everything in their power to avoid conscription, fleeing on planes and trains, and where that failed, on bicycles, scooters, and on foot. 
Satellite imagery and social media posts revealed miles-long traffic jams at Russia's borders with Georgia, Finland, Mongolia and Kazakhstan, among others. Thousands of cars and piles of abandoned bicycles attested to the scale of dissatisfaction. In Russia itself, images of forcibly repressed protesters, some of whom were whisked into military service themselves, littered social media, as Russian officials around the country went door-to-door -door delivering draft notices. Draconian laws in place prevent anyone from criticizing Putin's special military operation. Enlistment officers scoured the country for draft-age males. Under Russian law, men eligible for conscription must be handed a draft notice in person. As you might expect, evasion strategies revealed the ingenuity of many Russian males, some moving to summer cabins or disappearing on indefinite camping excursions in the countryside. Others disabled their doorbell so they wouldn't hear enlistment officers. Some even injured themselves as a way to gain a medical exemption. Not everyone had the luxury of leaving the lives they'd grown accustomed to. Tied to their homes by elderly parents, mortgages, or financial limitations, the unlucky were ushered into an uncertain military future. Draftees ran the gamut from 17-year-olds with no combat experience to avowed criminals and middle-aged men with diabetes and brain conditions. There was little regard for health, expertise, or background, even though Putin's draft specifically called for reservists with military skills. Naturally, the cannon fodder label has been applied to these new recruits, a common refrain among the men themselves, if scores of anecdotal telegram videos are to be believed. Zinc coffins are already coming, one jaded Russian military blogger complained as the mobilization unfolded. You told us that there will be training, that they would not be sent to the front line in a week, were you lying again? The bottom line is that the mobilization revealed stark structural manpower deficits, which, according to Michael Kaufman, led to problems with recruitment, retention, and rotation. Units which couldn't be rotated were quickly exhausted in combat, which led to the hiring of short-term volunteers, which further exacerbated the retention issues. It was a deadly cycle, one which saw Russian conscripts used up faster than a one-ply roll of toilet paper. Russian conscripts were eventually refused the right to refuse deployment, punishable by fine or a prison sentence. Others expecting to serve for only a few months saw their service in Ukraine extended indefinitely. The bigger red flag was the way these recruits were being trained for combat. In the past, Russian law stipulated that conscripts could not go into battle unless they'd had at least four months of training. Russia's own defense ministry website claims that an intensive four-week combined arms training with a survival course is essential for anyone who signs a contract with the Russian army. The program takes a total of 240 hours and includes shooting, throwing grenades, and a study of military tactics. Today, these standards are not observed. Incredibly, for such a vast mobilization in such a high-stakes war, there seems to be no uniform training regimen in place at all. In fact, reports commonly surface of conscripts being sent to the front mere days after joining the army, raising red flags across the globe. A week of training is nothing for a soldier. It's a direct path to a hospital or a body bag, one independent military analyst told journalists. Another director of a Russian human rights organization said that he'd been regularly approached by parents whose children signed a military contract and ended up in Ukraine just a week later. Another conscript was quoted as saying, after all the medical checkups, they asked me if I was ready to go to the military base the day after tomorrow. They trained us for five days. We waited for another five days for a force rotation, and then we went to combat positions. Of the informal training exercises his group conducted while waiting to deploy, he would remark, of course, it was not enough. There are grave supply and housing issues. There aren't enough vehicles or munitions to cycle to the rear to train on. Pulling antiquated vehicles and equipment from storage has been one temporary solution, but much of it requires extensive maintenance. As such, reports revealed how conscripts sent to the front had barely held a machine gun or seen a real tank, let alone operate them. Asked about his shooting practice during his 11-day training period before deployment, one conscript said he trained once, with three magazines in total. Others practiced marching in street clothes. No machine guns, nothing. No clothes, no shoes. Half of them are hungover, old, at risk. The ambulance should be on duty, the man grimly continued. There was a soldier in our company who didn't know how a machine gun works, so I taught that guy how to disassemble and assemble a machine gun. I wouldn't want to be next to him in battle. How can you fight like that? There were not enough beds or heated houses to accommodate the conscripts when they arrived for training. 
Russian sources revealed men without sleeping bags or blankets sleeping on hard floors or in streets, many of whom were barely fed, others sick or starving. Consequently, disorderly conduct was common. Shockingly, within a short span, hundreds of thousands of new draftees were deployed to Ukraine. Their presence confirmed the observation that the Russian military currently prioritizes getting personnel to the frontline positions in Ukraine quickly and appears to view the quality of their training as an afterthought. Yes, one could argue that history is in fact on Russia's side. They have thrown countless millions into the meat grinder of war dating back to Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812, a trend that continued strong through both world wars and survives well into the 21st century. All Russian battlefield success, it seems, comes only when unfeeling leaders are willing to pay an incredibly steep price, expending men and materiel as cannon fodder until the enemy exhausts himself. Putin should continue at his own peril. Conclusion There are countless other tactical and systemic issues which, in the interest of time, we'll have to table for a future episode. These include Russia's abject failure to implement a vile deception plan or achieve any form of surprise when it massed in Belarus prior to the invasion, Putin's more recent failure to control his own mercenary subordinates, Russia's inability to protect its own airspace against a growing fleet of cheap Ukrainian drones, the failure to instill operational security, which led to the deaths of dozens of high-ranking generals and officers to artillery, drone, and HIMARS attacks, and Putin's decision to let the war drag on indefinitely, which has only given Ukraine time to iterate and innovate novel military killing techniques, which continue to rain down impressive destructive power on Russian forces. These only scratch the surface. In the meantime, let us know what we missed in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from Military Experts. Ever thought of strapping a helicopter rocket launcher to the back of a Mitsubishi truck? Well, as you can see here, Ukrainian fighters have. There is no escape from Ukrainian weaponized civilian Mad Max vehicles, but if you see something like this Soviet-era Volga sedan mounted with a remote-controlled 14.5mm heavy machine gun rampaging your way, you should definitely at least give it a shot. And if you think these trucks are strange, wait till we show you what this 1940 SVT-40 Soviet semi-automatic battle rifle can do. Don't be fooled by its vintage look. This gun is far from being ready to be retired. The Russo-Ukraine war has definitely been producing some of the weirdest weapons we've seen fielded in recent history, maybe even ever, but how weird can it get? Join us as we dive into this rabbit hole and reveal the good, the bad, and the downright strange weapons seeing use in Ukraine, starting with oldies but goodies. It's a common misconception that the newest weapons are the best in modern warfare. Futuristic weapons sporting next-generation designs and big capability promises tend to attract the most public attention, but the war in Ukraine has proven that it's the workhorses, the time-tested OGs, that actually get the job done. In Russia and Ukraine's case, Soviet-era weapons have dominated the battlefield primarily by virtue of their sheer availability and ease of use. This doesn't mean they aren't good. Ukraine's Soviet-era defenses like the S-300 and Buk M1 here, for example, seem to have done an excellent job blunting Russian firepower. The AK-74 and all its variants, such as the AK-74M, are excellent infantry firearms. Ukraine's well-maintained and updated T-72 and T-64 tanks, designs now well over 50 years old, continue to hold their own against Russia's newer iterations, or at least what's left of them. When upgraded with modern electronics and munitions, Soviet-era weapons can more than hold their own in the 21st century. This was the case with the Soviet KH-35 subsonic anti-ship missile that Ukraine overhauled into its R-360 Neptune and used it to sink this jewel of Russia's Black Sea fleet, the Moskva, back in April 2022. There are other examples of Soviet-era weapons being overhauled, upgraded, and flat-out MacGyvered into menacing new packages, Look no further than the trusty RPG-7, the famous Soviet shoulder-fired, muzzle-loaded rocket launcher that has seen service all over the world, for a prime example. RPGs were designed to penetrate tank armor, though their cheap, mass-produced warheads have been used against emplacements, buildings, helicopters, and human targets since the weapon's introduction in 1961. With plenty of cheap RPG rounds at their disposal, Ukraine has adapted certain warheads for more effective anti-personnel use. 
Video evidence from early in the conflict showed a fearless Ukrainian demolitions expert taking an angle grinder to a live 82mm mortar round, loosening the stabilizer fins with a couple of hatchet blows, and fitting an adapter manufactured by volunteers, all to fit the mortar onto an RPG booster. No mobile mortar system, no problem. All you have to do is strap a rocket booster to a mortar round like this, and you get a man-portable anti-personnel munition that can be fired from a 15-pound tube. Ingenuity at its best. If this shoulder-fired RPG mortar hybrid didn't get the job done, why not just strap a bunch of anti-personnel grenades in a radial pattern around the anti-tank warhead itself? Well, that was exactly the line of thinking for some Ukrainian frontline units hoping to add a bit more juice to their anti-infantry RPG lineup. Images of makeshift explosives surfaced online revealing just that, an RPG warhead with a half dozen grenades fastened to it, a Frankenstein creation tailor-made for omnidirectional destruction. If the humble RPG is any indication, there are classics in use that are still very functional. And then there are classic throwbacks that are real head-scratchers. With the 75th anniversary celebrations unfolding around the globe, many weapons that played starring roles in World War II have been making their greatest hits comeback in Ukraine. Here are some of the most notable sightings. The Mosin Nagant M1891-30 and its successor, the SVT-40. Back in the heady days of 1891, well over 100 years ago, Captain Sergei Mosin chambered a 7.62x54mm R cartridge into his finalized bolt-action assembly after a decade of experimentation and pulled the trigger of a firearm that would ultimately become one of the most mass-produced military bolt-action rifles in history. 37 million Mosin rifles were built over the next eight decades, as the rifle saw service in 42 separate conflicts, a remarkable testament to its durability, reliability, and versatility. As you might have guessed, the Russo-Ukrainian War is the latest conflict to feature the time-worn Mosin. Updated in 1930, long and carbine versions of the M1891-30 model, the self-same workhorse that helped deliver the Allied victory in the East during World War II, has been seen in service today with Ukrainian and Russian forces alike. Dating back to 2014, Ukrainian separatists in the Donbass regularly utilized the Mosin in sniper roles. Some were doled out to Russian conscripts from deep Soviet stocks after Putin's military mobilization last year. Several of the Mosin's eventual successors, the semi-automatic SVT-40, SKS and the infamous AK-47, have also been seen in use. But this is just the beginning. The water-cooled M1910 Maxim machine gun. One of the strangest sightings in Ukraine actually predates the antiquated Mosin, if you can believe that. Somewhere, someplace, American inventor Hiram Maxim must have been looking on with an amused smile on his face when the armed forces of Ukraine wheeled his revolutionary M1910 Maxim machine gun out of storage. Yes, that Maxim gun, the world's first reliable, effective, mass-produced machine gun, and started using them back in the mid-2010s against the Russians in the Donbass. The Maxim was invented in 1884 and remained in production until 1945, widely adopted around the globe by imperial powers hell-bent on killing each other in two world wars and a host of other conflicts. The Soviets adopted it in 1930, and as the Soviet surplus often did, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, 35,000 Maxims found their way into Ukrainian storage. Many of them were dusted off, mounted onto vehicles, placed at checkpoints and fortifications, and used in other ways to repel the Russian invaders. Sporting protective armor plates and two heavy wheels to add mobility and stability, the Maxim uses the same 7.62x54mm ammunition as many other Soviet machine guns. Capable of firing 600 rounds a minute up to 3,000 meters away, the heavy Maxim is certainly not the best machine gun option on the battlefield, but this great war-killing machine is still showing its effectiveness 131 years later. Old Man Maxim would be proud. Other vestiges of the past have surfaced too. Back in 1947, the Soviet Union produced its last PPSH-41, a workhorse submachine gun used by the millions during World War II. With its recognizable drum magazine and high rate of fire, the open bolt burp gun fired 7.62 by 25 mm pistol rounds and saw use after World War II in Korea and Vietnam. Certain photos showed PPSH-41s and the PPS-43, its stamped steel brother in the hands of certain Ukrainian DNR separatist fighters and internal police units in the war's first few months, perhaps more a sign of desperation than utility. It wasn't the only World War II-era machine gun to feature, though. 
The unmistakable DPM, DP-27 and 28, the mainstay Red Army light machine gun by 1945, have also been seen with their traditional pan, circular top-loaded machine gun chambered for the 7.62x54mm R cartridge. The DPM was eventually replaced by the more robust PK series of light machine guns that are seen around the world. But lead is lead, and clearly the dusty DPM can still hold its own from time to time. We're not sure how many of these are actually in use, but they are certainly there. Speaking of chunky, relatively unwieldy Soviet-designed firearms that refuse to die, Ukrainian soldiers have been seen firing 80-plus-year-old PTRS-41 and PTRD-41 anti-tank rifles from covert positions. These bulky metal rifles were designed from 1938 to 1939 and produced throughout World War II as a stopgap to help Soviet infantrymen stand a chance against German lightly armored vehicles. The gun was essentially an SKS on steroids. For such a relatively cheap weapon, the weapon's 145 by 114 mm armor-piercing cartridges certainly did the job, penetrating armor plates up to 40 mm thick from 100 meters away. Reportedly used off and on by militiamen in the Donbass firing World War II vintage ammunition since 2014, they are still seen on social media from time to time. There are a few honorable mentions on our list. Firearms spotted on the battlefield as old as the ones we've already spoken about, but whose actual use can't be confirmed. These include several Nazi weapons including the MP40 and STG-44 submachine gun, as well as the MG42, the lead-spitting beast whose modern variant, the MG3, remains in use in more than 40 countries. Ironically, while certain Ukrainian units used a Nazi-designed machine gun to repel Russian soldiers, early photos from the war showed American-built Lend-Lease Thompson submachine guns taken from captured Russian prisoners. It's impossible to know if this was a one-off sighting, but its presence makes odd sense, considering the United States shipped millions of Tommy guns to the Soviets, then fighting the Nazis back during World War II. Adding more American flavor to the hodgepodge of vintage firearms in Ukraine, if Russian state media is to be believed, the Ukrainians have been using US-made M101 towed howitzers firing 105mm shells on front lines near Zaporizhia, an artillery piece fielded by the US Army during World War II. These M101s were allegedly donated by Lithuania back in September 2022. What about imported flavors? 32 nations from tiny North Macedonia to Slovakia Slovenia, Spain, and Sweden have all pledged varying amounts of military aid to Ukraine since the start of the war. Some countries, like the United States, can offer tens of billions of dollars worth of expensive vehicles, drones, munitions, and equipment. Others, like Portugal, donate grenades, small arms ammunition, some automatic rifles, and firefighting helicopters. That Ukraine has taken this jumbled admixture of arms and equipment and made it work speaks to their pluck and resourcefulness, traits the Western world has come to admire. In this deluge of aid, a long list of modern small arms have flowed into the country. Ukraine is unique in the annals of military history in that respect. An independent country whose rapidly revitalized military operates with such a vast range of amalgamated systems and platforms. Across the front lines, soldiers are now fighting with M4 carbines, M240s, M32 grenade launchers, and M2 Brownings, alongside smaller numbers of submachine guns donated by private American companies. Desert Tech sent its Bullpup SRS-A1 anti-material rifle, an insanely accurate rifle that fires the powerful .338 Lapua Magnum round, while Keltec sent 400 sub-2009 mm machine guns to make up for a civilian contract they'd lost track of. There's even been a sighting of a suppressed American Barrett 50 caliber sniper rifle. To this list, the Ukrainians employ many foreign imports. Czech firearms like the CZ-805 Bren and the ZVI Falcon Op-99 anti-material rifle, British Starstreak laser-guided high-velocity air defense systems, futuristic-looking Belgian FN-2000s, German MP5s, and licensed versions of Israeli small arms like the Tavor and Negev manufactured by Fort, a Ukrainian firm based out of Vinitsia. We've also seen next-generation variants of time-tested designs surface like the Bullpup ASH-12.7 and the Russian-made assault rifle or the AK-12, a fifth-generation Kalashnikov assault rifle introduced in just 2018. Unlike the AK-74, the AK-12 is chambered in the 5.45 by 39mm round, with the Russian variant capable of firing the 7.62, known as the AK-15. With its free-floating barrel, cheaper cost per unit, and stronger construction, the AK-12 features improved accuracy and resilience. Okay, let's get to the juicy stuff. 
The ripest field for weird weapons during the Ukraine war hasn't really been in a field at all. It's been in the air, where unmanned drones and cruise missiles rule the skies and deliver pinpoint destruction at the push of a joystick. Recently, a Russian blackjack strategic bomber fired a KH-55 cruise missile stripped of its nuclear warhead at Ukraine. Yes, you heard that right. They fired a nuclear-capable cruise missile, albeit an older one designed in the 1980s, with weighted ballast in place of its nuclear warhead. But why? The KH-55 cruise missile was first designed in the mid-1970s. Fired from the belly of a Tupolev Tu-160 blackjack supersonic bomber, the turbofan 200 kiloton yield cruise missiles were the spear of Russia's nuclear deterrent for decades. It may seem strange, but firing an inert nuclear cruise missile makes some sense. Increasingly, as Ukrainian air defenses improve, Russia has seen less success bombarding civilian infrastructure. Cruise missiles are expensive, and Russia seems to be running out. Using older air-launched KH-55 missiles plucked out of storage might be Russia's way of trying to overwhelm Ukraine's air defenses without wasting money on expensive missiles that get intercepted or miss their mark. Russia has tried to overwhelm Ukraine's air defenses in other ways too. Back in March 2022, Ukraine released photos of a partially destroyed mystery munition, resembling a dart released from an Iskander-M short-range ballistic missile. The strange devices were each a foot long, painted with an orange tail, and contained a heat source but no explosive warhead. The findings were puzzling. Experts believe the darts to be bomblets on part of some sort of cluster munition package. Later, they revised their thesis arguing these dart-like munitions were some sort of penetration aid, a Cold War-era device used as a countermeasure to help primary ballistic missiles reach their target. The darts worked as decoys, like the KH-55 cruise missile mentioned earlier. Loaded up with electronic jammers and heat sources, they can attract missiles, full radars, and foil infrared seekers. Jeffrey Lewis, professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California, claimed it was a very curious decision by the Russians to use decoy missiles, considering that at that stage Ukraine still lacked the military capabilities to successfully shoot down Iskander missiles. These penetration aids were highly classified for decades, making their subsequent discovery an intelligence bonanza for the West. Another mysterious impact crater, this one far from Ukraine in the Croatian capital of Zagreb, made the world wonder what on earth the Russian military was up to one month into its invasion. On March 10, 2022, an unmanned aerial vehicle overflew Romanian, Hungarian and Croatian airspace, flying 430 miles per hour at 4,300 feet before careering into a Croatian school campus and crashing into soft ground. The local residents were fortunate the drone landed just 160 feet from a highly populated student dormitory. Incredibly, nobody was hurt. Initial theories claimed it had been a Ukrainian army recon drone. Inspections of the surviving wreckage painted a different picture. The presence of Cyrillic markings and a Soviet Red Star insignia prompted an American analyst to identify the aircraft as a Russian Tupolev Tu-141 drone, an unmanned aircraft used since the 1970s. Subsequent investigations revealed that the drone was indeed carrying a warhead. Nobody ever found out whether it had been a Russian drone or was in fact an off-course Ukrainian drone that ran out of fuel. Either way, the crash sparked an international incident, with residents and politicians from several NATO countries wondering how such a drone could so effortlessly penetrate their airspace. But the drone story doesn't end there. Russia has employed plenty of drones to observe and attack Ukrainian civilian and military targets. One of the most unique iterations has been the Zala KUB BLA Kamikaze drone, a short-range loitering munition manufactured by a subsidiary of the Kalashnikov company. The KUB BLA, measured with a wingspan of 1.2 meters, can carry a 3-kilogram payload and travel 130 kilometers per hour. It has a maximum range of 40 kilometers and a flight time of 30 minutes, so it can't be employed far beyond Russian positions but it can make use of AI technologies on approach, making adjustments and identifying its static target. Several KUB BLA drones were intercepted over Kyiv in the early days of the invasion, sparking theories that they were being used to target Ukraine's president Volodymyr Zelensky and decapitate the Ukrainian government. Some of the most interesting drone footage captured during the war, however, doesn't come from military drones at all. It comes from the cheap, commercially produced drones that the Ukrainians have jerry-rigged for all manner of missions. Using 3D printers, a soldering iron, cheap hardware, and some plain old-fashioned ingenuity, Ukraine's army of commercial drones have now been retrofitted for offensive service, and to great effect. It took lots of experimentation and refinement to engineer a light enough grenade to knock out enemy armor using nothing but altitude and gravity. 
Very quickly, Ukrainians succeeded in engineering lightweight munitions that did not affect a drone's flight path whatsoever. A real engineering masterclass. War is economy. It's money. One Ukrainian soldier commented on the rationale for making everyday drones more lethal. If you have a drone for $3,000 and a grenade for $200, and you destroy a tank that costs $3 million, that's very interesting. Interesting indeed. Makeshift air-delivered care packages have gone on to achieve global renown, both the deadly and the benign. Viral videos show deft Ukrainian drone operators conducting the wartime equivalent of a basketball trick shot, landing grenades in open tank hatches, underground air pipes, narrow trenches, and populated foxholes from hundreds of feet in the air. In other settings, drone modifications have been shown being used to transport small packages of sugar to frontline soldiers, and even most recently, to steal an enemy radio set from a dead Russian soldier that was subsequently used to listen in on enemy plans for several days. The Ukrainians have thanked their Russian enemy for their default Lend-Lease program. Abandoned and salvaged equipment, most of it virtually interchangeable with what they already carry into battle, provides an ongoing boon to Ukrainian military effectiveness. But not all strange and unique weapons are captured intact. While the Ukrainians will make use of the captured firearms and other weapons for a long time to come, vehicle debris recovered after a skirmish almost a year ago revealed a destroyed Russian prototype tank many believed to be one of a kind. Video footage from a March 17, 2022 clash showed the burnt-out remains of a completely unique tank, a T-80 UM-2 Black Eagle. This particular Black Eagle was in bad shape. Like so many before and after it, its autoloader had taken a direct hit, which promptly exploded and blew its turret clean off. It was an interesting find. The T-80 UM-2 was once part of a next-generation tank development project, codenamed Object 640, or Black Eagle. The first iteration of the main battle tank appeared in 1997. At the time, Russia touted the experimental, modified T-80U as something that would easily hold its own against Western main battle tanks like the M1A2 Abrams. It boasted Cactus Explosive Reactive Armor ERA panels on its front hull and track skirts, a welded steel turret, anti-fragmentation screens around the main gun, and eventually, DROSD-2 Active Protection System a radar-operated anti-rocket and missile fragmentation defense net that can disable incoming munitions 20 to 30 feet from the tank. Unfortunately and predictably for Russia, the project never got off the ground. The T-80 UM-2 never entered production, and the prototype became a trial platform for new systems until, in early 2022, it was lumped into a Russian military column, ambushed north of Kyiv, and utterly destroyed. Perhaps Russia was keen to test out its capabilities on the modern battlefield. At any rate, one of the only tanks deployed to Russia so far to feature an anti-protection system didn't fare well. Remember that saying, desperate times call for desperate measures? Having now lost over 1,600 confirmed tanks in battle, 536 of them captured outright by Ukraine, Russia's real strategy has been to scrape the bottom of the barrel for dilapidated and poorly maintained Soviet-era surplus in its stocks, hastily modernized them and shipped them off into the meat grinder for use by ill-trained conscripts and mercenaries. Recent images on social media, for example, show several BRDM-2MS 4x4 armored reconnaissance vehicles being overhauled at Russia's 103rd armored repair plant near Chita in Siberia. However, the BRDM-2MS isn't much to write home about. It's an updated version of the BRDM-2, a Soviet amphibious lightly armored vehicle introduced into service back in 1966. Fitted with a coaxial 7.62 machine gun and a one-man turret with a 14.5mm KPVT machine gun, mechanics were shown outfitting the paint-chipped vehicle with new thermal sights and, hopefully, a new coat of paint. Which again begs the question, why? Given the rate of vehicular destruction in Ukraine, operating the four-man BRDM-2MS will be like riding a tin box into battle against the likes of the modern AT-4, Javelin, or Enlor. Yes, it's nice to have wheels when you're an infantryman, but all the time and energy spent modernizing or perhaps more accurately, restoring a vehicle that will barely stand up to Ukrainian artillery, mines, and tanks, much less the far cheaper Western anti-tank missiles commonly employed across the front just seems counterproductive, like Putin's entire war. Yes, it may just be for show. Perhaps it may even excel in a behind-the-lines transport role. Nobody knows just how many BRDMs will see combat, but if they are deployed to the front, one Twitter user observed that Russia's upgrades are tantamount to having an 82 Honda and slapping a backup camera to it. They certainly won't protect their occupants. We do know that the same repair plant has modernized oodles of Cold War antique T-62s of all types. 
the same ones seen on railway cars headed to the front at various stages of the war thus far. Most of these museums on tracks, culled from deep storage, have not seen combat in decades, if at all, and their maintenance records reflect that fact. Most are being fitted with new engines, thermal imaging, bulkier armor, new comms, and better optics. The mere presence of the T-62 in Ukraine, 20,000 of which were being mass-produced during the Cold War from 1961 to 1973, shows how depleted Putin's starting lineup of T-80 and T-72 tanks has become. Attrition has forced him deep into his reserves. The number of T-72s in storage are reported to be far lower than anticipated, many of them mothballed and unsalvageable. T-62s are often used by reserve units in the east and thus kept in better condition. But if they get deployed to the front, no amount of cope cages welded onto the T-62 chassis will be able to protect these relics from destruction. Think of what would happen if all of a sudden the United States Armed Forces started wheeling M60s out of storage and slapping modern equipment onto them. Sure, it could do something, the same way a T-62 can. If deployed to fortify an occupied town or doled out as a training implement, it could provide some utility. But as David Axe, a Forbes defense writer, said it, there's no evidence the T-62s played any meaningful role in the fighting. There's ample evidence their four-man crews abandoned the tanks at first opportunity. The Cheetah plant has allegedly been tasked with refurbishing 800 T-62s by 2025. As you may have noticed, this list of the strangest, weirdest weapons in Ukraine isn't exactly short, and it's hardly exhaustive. Ukrainian soldiers have reportedly captured one Russian prisoner armed with a Chinese-made single-shot pellet rifle. There is also that iconic image of a Russian Roskvardia member guarding a checkpoint in Kherson with an antique 12-pound Napoleonic-era cannon. It could all be a joke, a stunt for social media, or a decoy to fool the Ukrainians. Either way, it's surreal that so many historic and head-scratching pieces have made their way onto the battlefields of Ukraine. Did we miss anything? What's your strange weapon of choice from this list? Let us know in the comments. How incompetent can Putin get? Since the war in Ukraine started, he's been losing tanks by the dozens on a daily level. His military has been unable to deliver powerful air and artillery strikes or apply modern military tactics and strategies, and the list doesn't stop there. When Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the world's attention was naturally riveted on the land war. There, Russia's poor command structure and logistical incompetence became apparent within the first week, with the attack on Kyiv stalling. Since then, Russia has been forced to take hundreds of thousands of casualties in a war of attrition that has raged for 20 months and counting. However, Russia's incompetence has extended to the seas as well. In the build-up to the conflict and early stages of the war, military observers feared that Russia would quickly take control of the seas and stage an amphibious attack on Odessa, Ukraine's third largest city. If Russia took Odessa, it would essentially cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea entirely and leave it a poor, landlocked rump state. Such fears proved unfounded. A landing near Odessa never came. Instead, the biggest stories involving Russia's navy in this war have been of its numerous humiliations. What happened? Today, Russia has essentially ceded control of the Western Black Sea and is increasingly not even safe within its haven in Crimea. But why has the Russian navy proven so ineffective in the war? To be as fair as we can to Russia, it is and always has been in a bad geostrategic position with regards to the sea. Ever since the days of Peter the Great, Russia has aspired to be a sea power. However, geography makes this difficult to do, as its ports are either contained within choke points, freeze over in the winter, or both. The quest for improved access to the sea has been a vital objective for Russia's foreign policy since the early 18th century, and Russia has never quite been able to achieve this goal. Even at the height of its power during the Soviet Union, unrestricted access to the sea was an objective that still eluded Moscow. In this light, it is understandable why Russia places such a high strategic importance on Crimea and why it was willing to use military force to secure it. It is one of Russia's few warm water ports. Unfortunately for the Russians, there's a problem. The Turks command the transit points between the Black and Mediterranean seas through their control of the Bosporus and Dardanelles. This control was formalized through the 1936 Montreux Convention regarding the regime of the Straits. The convention allows complete freedom of transit for the commercial vessels of any country through these straits during peacetime. In times of war, however, Turkey, if it is not a party to the conflict, can close the straits to transiting ships unless they are returning to their bases. 
Three days after Russia invaded Ukraine, Turkey invoked the Montreux Convention's wartime provisions for the first time, refusing Russian naval vessels in the Mediterranean access to the Black Sea. For example, at the end of November 2022, two Russian warships left the Mediterranean through the Suez Canal after nine months of idling after Turkey forbid them from transiting through the Dardanelles and Bosporus to the Black Sea. The effect of the Montreux Convention has been to cut off Russia's ability to reinforce its Black Sea fleet. For Ukraine, this was a significant piece of diplomatic aid. It immediately made Russian naval officers more cautious, knowing that every ship in the fleet was precious. Even so, it seemed far-fetched that Ukraine would be able to significantly impede the operations of the Russian Black Sea fleet. That opinion quickly started to change, however. Ukraine proved its ability to strike at the Russian Navy early in the war. Three days after it invaded Ukraine, and on the same day the Turks invoked the Montreux Convention, Russia captured the strategically important port of Berdyansk. The Ukrainian military and Western observers were understandably concerned that the Russian ships that piled into Berdyansk could either land troops in the rear of Ukraine's southern lines or attack Odessa. Then, at about 7.45 a.m. on March 24, exactly a month after the invasion, the landing craft Saratov mysteriously exploded and sank in port at Berdyansk. Ships of the Saratov's class, the Alligator-class tank landing ship, can land up to 425 soldiers or marines, with armored support of either 40 infantry fighting vehicles or 20 tanks. The loss of this vessel was thus a significant blow to Russia's ability to conduct amphibious operations. How did this happen? From the beginning of the conflict, NATO has provided Ukraine with excellent intelligence, and Ukraine's intelligence units got the word that the Saratov was loaded with munitions at the time of the attack. Ukraine used this intelligence and a Cold War-era Tochka-U Scarab short-range ballistic missile to carry out the deed. The Tochka-U has a range of about 120 kilometers. We do not know how many of these missiles Ukraine used in the attack, but what is known is that Russia's modern air defense systems should have easily been able to intercept these Soviet weapons. Russian media at the time reported that its forces had done just that, although the real story came in July, when the Saratov was raised from the depths of the sea. Russia's supposedly modern air defense network failed to act against a much older weapon system. Meanwhile, two other ships, the Cesar Kunikov and Novichokask, were seen on video departing from the flaming Saratov. They also suffered damage in the attack and were forced to retreat to Crimea. Eleven sailors on board the Saratov died in the incident. Ukraine's next assault on the Russian Navy would become the most famous of the war. This was the sinking of the cruiser Moskva, the flagship of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, in April 2022. This incident was apparently so humiliating for Russia that its Ministry of Defense still offers no details about what happened and avoids talking about it in public, to the point that the families of the sailors on board are still left in the dark about the fates of their loved ones. How exactly this incident unfolded is still unclear. After the successful attack, American sources reported that the Ukrainians had used liquid-fueled Neptune anti-ship cruise missiles, sending them to coordinates provided by U.S. intelligence by way of a P-8 Poseidon maritime surveillance aircraft that flew out of Italy and looked around the Black Sea. Ukraine denied this report, however. According to the Ukrainians, April 13, 2022 was the worst day to sink the cruiser, because the weather was so bad for such a precise, premeditated attack. The coastline was covered with low, dark rain clouds on that day. The Ukrainian radars in the area had a limited 18-kilometer range because of the bad weather. Knowing this, the Moskva's crew got a wee bit careless. According to Ukrainian sources, at the time of the invasion, we had no over-the-horizon radars and Russia knew it. But since the clouds were very low and a signal in this corridor between the water and the clouds had nowhere to go, the radar suddenly reached and identified Moskva. The ship's crew seemingly ignored this potentially deadly situation and were so lax about their security that the air defense systems were inactive. They had not noticed that they had just sailed to within the Neptune's 200-kilometer range. Ukraine may have at this point used a Turkish Bayraktar TB2 drone to distract the Moskva and then launch the missiles. For a while after the attack, Ukrainian crews did not know what happened but radar soon revealed that four Russian ships were rushing to the Moskva from different directions. Later, the Ukrainians realized that a tugboat had also been dispatched from Crimea, hoping to save the ailing ship. At this point, the weather cooperated again too. When a storm began at sea, 
and made rescue operations much harder, it became impossible to save the Moskva then, and it sank beneath the waves. Hundreds of Russian sailors reportedly saw their flagship get hit by two Neptune missiles. The Moskva incident is more baffling because the ship was an air defense cruiser. If running properly, the Moskva should have gotten as much as four minutes of warning that the Ukrainian cruise missiles were on their way. The Russian cruiser also had a triple layer of protection against such air attacks. Its defenses included the S-300F surface-to-air missiles, 9K-33 OSA air defense missiles, AK-360 close-in 30mm cannons, chaff, decoys, and electronic defense systems. However, no one recorded the Moskva using any of these systems against the Ukrainian cruise missiles. The ship just sat there. Why were none of these systems active? Was the ship's radar system defective? We might never know the answer. Whatever the reason, the Moskva was the largest Russian vessel sunk since World War II and the first loss of a Russian flagship since the Russo-Japanese War. Russia says that 18 crew members died. Other sources say it was as many as 600. Either way, the incident shocked the Kremlin, with Ukraine's demonstrated anti-ship capabilities and no way for it to bring replacements thanks to the Turks' invocation of the Montreux Convention, Russia became even more cautious about how it would use its naval assets. Since this incident, the Black Sea Fleet has been bottled up around its base in Sevastopol, Crimea. With this knowledge, Ukrainian troops confidently strode forward with their Kherson counteroffensive between August and November of 2022 safe in the knowledge that the Russian Navy would not be bothering them with missile attacks from the Black Sea, let alone amphibious operations behind their lines. Even with the Russian Navy's retreat to the relatively safe Crimea, Ukraine wasn't done showing off its prowess in sinking ships. Next up was the rescue tug for Sili Bek. While far less spectacular a target than the Moskva, these tugs are important to the maintenance of a naval fleet. This role is especially important in the Black Sea due to Russia's inability to reinforce its fleet this ship was new too, being launched in 2016 and commissioned in 2017. On June 17, 2022, Ukrainian forces attacked the Vasily Bek when it was on its way to resupply Russian soldiers stationed on Snake Island, a place already made famous from the start of the war when the garrison there used colorful language in response to Russia's demands for surrender. The Ukrainians hit the Vasily Bek with two Harpoon anti-ship cruise missiles. The ship stood no chance and went down, with about 10 Russian KIA in the incident and a $25 million Tor air defense system on board that was supposed to be placed on the island. On June 30th, Russia evacuated its garrison from Snake Island. Moscow claimed that this move was an act of goodwill in recognition of a humanitarian corridor that was part of its grain export deal with Ukraine. In reality, Russia evacuated its troops from Snake Island because the attack on the Vasily Bek made its military brass realize that it's too risky to reinforce and resupply the outpost. It was a tacit admission that Russia had ceded the Black Sea west of Crimea to Ukraine. But the Ukrainians weren't done yet. The Olenogorsky Gorniak, a Rapucha-class landing ship, was Ukraine's next target. On August 4, 2023, Ukraine used drone boats to swarm the ship and its neighbors when it was docked in the Black Sea port of Novorossiysk. Not all the drones made it through Russian defenses, but the attack on the Olenogorsky Gorniak succeeded. The ship did not sink, but it needed to be put in a dry dock to repair the heavy damage. It's unlikely that the ship will return to action anytime soon. The water drone Ukraine used in the attack was a new low-visibility grey boat that can be operated via remote control. The drone boat has a high payload, able to carry a 300-kilogram warhead up to a range of 800 kilometers. The boat also features a satellite communications array at its rear. A Ukrainian operator of these drones explained their low profile was designed to exploit weaknesses in Russian ship defenses. It was an adaptation from their earlier attacks, where Russian ships spotted drone boats and sank them with artillery and small arms fire once they got to within visual range. The attack on the Olenogorsky Gorniak reveals that Ukraine has absorbed these lessons and is adapting with its newer drone boats. Russia claims that it foiled a similar attack on an oil facility after this incident, but as always, these claims should be treated with skepticism. Most recently, Ukraine attacked targets in Sevastopol, the headquarters of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, and other targets in Crimea. On September 13th, Ukrainian forces struck the Sergo Ordzonikidze shipyard in Sevastopol, a major repair base. Ukraine reportedly used 10 Franco-British Storm Shadow cruise missiles in the attack. Russia's Ministry of Defense claims that air defense systems in the area 
shot seven of these missiles down, but that effort was clearly not enough. The Russian Kilo-class diesel-electric submarine Rostov-on-Don and the large landing ship Minsk were struck and destroyed by the storm shadows. Key infrastructure on the base was also damaged in this incident. However, the missile attack was only the climax of the operation. Other units were essential for shaping it. Prior to the attack, Ukrainian special operators seemed to have destroyed one of Russia's nearby S-400 air defense systems and took control of an oil facility that housed a local radar unit. By downing these systems, the Ukrainians set the stage for the strike on Sevastopol. It would only be the first of several attacks on Crimean targets in the weeks ahead. On September 14th, Ukraine again struck at the Russian Navy on the seas. Its general staff said it had targeted two ships in the Western Black Sea and released a video showing a Russian patrol ship appearing to come under attack by drone boats. The Russian Ministry of Defense confirmed that one of its ships, the Sergei Kotov, had been attacked but repelled the assault. Meanwhile, that same day, Ukrainian forces used cruise missiles and drones to destroy a Russian air defense network in the Crimean city of Yevpatoria. Then, on September 22nd, Ukraine launched another attack on Sevastopol. Ukraine sent several Storm Shadow cruise missiles at targets there. Russia claims that it shot most of them down, but one made it through, hitting the Black Sea Fleet's headquarters. The attack set the main building ablaze, and Russian officials said at least one service member went missing in the aftermath. Ukraine alleges that the strike was timed to coincide with a meeting of high-level Russian officials. Kirillo Budanov, Ukraine's intelligence chief, says that two Russian commanders were badly injured in the attack. Later, Ukraine's special operations forces said the strike had killed Viktor Sokolov, the commander of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, along with 33 others. No independent source verified this claim, however. Sokolov reportedly attended a soccer awards ceremony to prove he was not dead on September 27th, although there are claims that this was a duplicate. As always, we should know more in time. What we do know is that the Institute for the Study of War confirmed an attack on the 744th Communication Center of the Command of the Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. And the problems are only piling on for Russia. In late September, the Biden administration seemingly finally gave Ukraine what it has wanted for so long. Although it was not officially announced, it's likely that Ukraine will be getting ATAC-M's missiles in the near future. These weapons can hit targets up to 300 kilometers away, 50 kilometers further than the Storm Shadow. And unlike the Storm Shadow, which requires a riskier launch from a fighter jet, ATAC-M's can be fired from Ukraine's HIMARS platforms on the ground. ATAC-M's would be ideal for launching attacks on Sevastopol. Meanwhile, if Ukraine gets ATACMs, it's also possible that Germany will agree to supply Ukrainians with Taurus air-launched cruise missiles that have even greater range than ATACMs. This weapon system would be ideal for targeting the Kerch Bridge, connecting Crimea to the Russian mainland. A drone attack already damaged the Kerch Bridge a year ago. This scenario would be far more threatening. Ukraine has renewed its attacks on Crimea for a few reasons. First, Russia has allowed the grain export deal that Turkey and the UN brokered in July 2022 to expire. Russia's Black Sea Fleet has resumed its blockade of such exports, making it a more important target for Ukraine to destroy. Crimea is also the linchpin of Russia's logistics in Ukraine. Being able to resupply its troops from Crimea is vital to the Russian war effort. Ukrainian disruption of Russian Navy logistics from Crimea is one of the reasons why Moscow now considers it too dangerous to send ships to the west of the peninsula. An attack on Russia's ports in Crimea would disrupt the supply chain to all the branches of Russia's military, and it appears that the Black Sea Fleet is helpless in stopping such attacks. Crimea is also a highly political target, with Ukrainian President Zelensky saying that this war started in Crimea and will end in Crimea. The recapture of Crimea would be the greatest victory for the Ukrainian military, a highly symbolic measure of its triumph. The stakes are just as high, or even higher, for Putin. Prior to the invasion of Ukraine, he sold his occupation and annexation of Crimea to the Russian public as his crowning foreign policy achievement. If Russian occupation of Crimea becomes untenable through missile and drone attacks, and supplying the Russian forces in other parts of Ukraine from Crimea also becomes untenable, Putin's political position at home erodes, and the entire Russian war effort risks breaking down. The war has already put Russia through isolation, economic hardship, and hundreds of thousands of casualties. If Russia cannot gain anything from the hostilities and winds up losing Crimea too, or if it at least cannot use the peninsula for strategic purposes, it's difficult to see how Putin would be able to remain in power. 
which he plans to do until at least 2036. In this scenario, Russian elites may decide that the time is right for their country to finally get a new leader. There is a presidential election in Russia in 2024. Although elections in Russia are only formalities, the 2024 election could serve as a pretext to oust Putin from power if the war goes too poorly between now and then. It's understandable why Crimea and the Black Sea Fleet would become an increasingly high priority for Ukraine. All wars are first and foremost political. Even if things don't turn out that way, Ukraine's effective neutralization of the Russian Black Sea Fleet is an astounding military achievement. Early in the war, Ukraine forced the Black Sea Fleet to retreat to what it believed was the safety of Crimea. Now, through the actions of its intelligence units, special operators and missile and air units, it's showing that not even Crimea is safe. If ATAC-Ms and Taurus missiles soon arrive, that point will only be made clearer. What do you think will come next in the war at sea? Will Ukraine soon use ATAC-Ms missiles to destroy Russian ships and docks in Sevastopol? Is the Kerch Bridge safe for Russia? Let us know what you think in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. The Navy Along with aviation are the branches of the military in which Russia had an incredible advantage before the start of a full-scale invasion of Ukraine and until now, but it's useless. Why is the country with the third strongest navy losing a water war to Ukraine? The last attacks on Crimea and Russian navy bases proved once more that Russian navy superiority makes no sense on the battlefield. In this video, we will explain why. Let's start with the numbers. Prior to the invasion, the Russian naval forces had a total of 266 active units in their inventory. The Russian Navy placed a strong emphasis on safeguarding its coastline and conducting underwater operations, with a significant allocation of resources to corvettes, comprising 31.2% with 83 units, submarines, constituting 21.8% with 58 units, and mine countermine warfare, making up 18% with 48 units. The remainder of the fleet exhibited a relatively even distribution, encompassing categories such as aircraft carriers 1 unit, cruisers and battle cruisers 5 units, destroyers 12 units, frigates 11 units, offshore patrol vessels 27 units, and amphibious assault support ships 21 units. The majority of Russian vessels were considered outdated and had been inherited from the USSR. The most prominent examples are the aircraft carrier Kuznetsov, which was 32 years old, the cruiser Moskva, which was 39, and the destroyer Vadim Kulikov, which was 40. As of February 24th, the Russian Federation's Black Sea Fleet comprised a total of 275 ships and vessels, with just 58 of them classified as combat ships. When considering patrol boats alongside combat vessels, the Black Sea Fleet's combined combat-capable units numbered 74 by February 2022. In the months leading up to the full-scale invasion, Russia systematically removed almost any naval assets that could potentially be used for a seaborne invasion. A total of 46 warships were redeployed from all of the Russian Federation's fleets to the Black and Azov Seas. Under the pretext of conducting large-scale exercises, the Kremlin effectively established a naval blockade along the Black Sea coastline of Ukraine from February 13th to 19th, 2022. The Mediterranean Sea also witnessed an unprecedented presence of Russian troops, consisting of 17 warships from all four Russian Federation fleets, including two missile cruisers, as well as an additional seven missile ships of various types, including two missile submarines. But how have Russia's naval moves changed Ukraine's navy? During the initial phase of the Russian-Ukraine war and the occupation of Crimea in 2014, Russian forces seized 51 Ukrainian ships, accounting for 85% of the Ukrainian Navy fleet. Imagine how bad that was. By 2022, the Ukrainian Navy's active naval inventory consisted of only 15 units. The contemporary Ukrainian Navy heavily relied on its patrol force. The service faced significant deficiencies across various categories and domains primarily comprising aging vessel ships in critical areas essential for naval effectiveness. For instance, their lone frigate, the Sahai Dachny, is approaching three decades in service, while their single mine or countermine vessel has exceeded 35 years of service. Apart from a couple of landing craft, which have also significantly surpassed their intended service life, 
the service possesses a limited collection of offshore patrol vessels, OPVs. Among these OPVs, the youngest hulls are no more than five years old, while the oldest ones date back four decades. Okay, so Ukraine's fleet experienced significant losses right from the start, but what exactly happened? At the outset of the invasion, Russian warships were relocated to the Odessa area. Subsequently, Russian forces managed to seize control of Snake Island, Serpent Island or Zmini Island, a small yet strategically significant island southwest of Odessa. The valiant defense of the island by Ukrainian forces, along with the defiant phrase, Russian warship go F yourself, played a crucial role in bolstering the morale of Ukrainians who had endured heavy losses over an extended period. On March 3, 2022, Ukraine deliberately sank its frigate, the Sahaiduchny, as it had encountered the ravages of war near the wells of a factory in Mykolaiv and was deemed unfit for further service. On the same day, another setback occurred for the Ukrainian fleet when the Ukrainian patrol vessel Slovyansk was sunk by a Russian Federation aircraft struck by a KH-31 missile. In early March, the patrol ship Karets and riverboat BK-02 Ackerman and BK-06 Vishorod were also captured in Berdyansk. Likewise, in early March, BK-04 Kremenchuk and BK-05 Lubny were seized in Mariupol. The small reconnaissance ship A-512 Periaslev likely sustained damage on the Dnipro River in late March 2022. The amphibious assault boat Stanislav was lost during a Ukrainian counterattack on the Zmini Island on May 7, 2022. The island was deoccupied at the beginning of July. Subsequently, in July 2022, the raid minesweeper Henichesk was sunk in a missile attack carried out by Russian aircraft. Another boat was hit on November 4, 2022. From that time until today, several other ships were also damaged. As a conclusion, the small Ukrainian fleet suffered huge losses. But it didn't give up at all. In spite of these achievements and the blockade of Ukrainian ports, the aggressor eventually faced consequences for their invasion. As of October 1, 2023, a total of 20 Russian ships and boats, along with one submarine, have been destroyed, marking two significant turning points on March 24 and April 14, 2022, that forever altered perceptions of the invincibility of the Russian fleet. On March 24, 2022, substantial damage was inflicted on the large amphibious ships Novochakask and Sezakunikov, while the large amphibious assault ship Saratov was completely destroyed. This incident resulted in numerous casualties and injuries among personnel, as well as damage to military equipment that had been transported by these ships to the occupied port of Berdyansk. Saratov came under attack from Ukrainian Tochka U missiles a Soviet tactical missile system originally designed for ground targets and not previously employed against ships. What a surprise! On the night of April 13th to April 14th, which was 21 days after the attack on the large amphibious ships in Berdyansk, the flagship of the Russian Federation's Black Sea Fleet, the guard missile cruiser Moskva, came under attack. Let's delve into this particular incident in greater detail. So here's what happened. The ship met its demise when it was targeted by two Ukrainian-made Neptune missiles. The inaugural Neptune system, mounted on a new Tatra chassis, was assembled in August 2021 in preparation for Ukraine's 30th Independence Day parade. However, the first batch of missiles ordered by the state for the military didn't reach Odessa until February 20, 2022. Initial missile launches occurred promptly, prior to February 26 when three Russian amphibious ships departed from ports in Crimea and steered towards the Ukrainian coast in the Mykolaiv region. The Russians managed to intercept and neutralize all three missiles, but the realization that Ukraine possessed this missile capability prompted the ships to hastily return to Crimea. This development surprised the Russians since the Neptune missiles weren't scheduled to be in the armed forces arsenal by late February. Following the failed launch, doubts arose regarding the missile's quality. In mid-March, experts from Kyiv conducted an inspection and discovered that all the missiles shared a single component failure, which had prevented them from detonating as intended. This issue was promptly rectified, and the Neptune missiles awaited an opportune moment for testing, which unexpectedly came on April 13th. You can't even imagine how lucky the Ukrainians were. Conventional radar indicated the presence of a significant target roughly 120 kilometers from the coast. In this sector of the Black Sea, only one object matched the size, the flagship of the Russian Federation's Black Sea fleet, the cruiser Moskva. 
Due to dense clouds over the sea, the radar signal bounced off the clouds onto the water's surface and back to the clouds. The Russians were so confident in their invulnerability to Ukrainian forces that they likely hadn't even activated their air defense systems. Even if they had, the Neptune missiles would have posed formidable challenges for them. The Neptune is a slow-moving, liquid-fueled missile that approaches its target unnoticed until the very last moment, making it almost invisible to standard air defense systems as it skims over the water. It boasts a maximum flight range of up to 300 kilometers and a speed of 900 kilometers an hour, with a missile length of 5,050 millimeters and a launch weight of around 870 kilograms, including a 150 kilogram combat warhead. These specifications are more than sufficient for disabling combat surface ships and transport vessels weighing up to 5,000 tons. The missile is equipped with a cross shaped folding wing, and its warhead is activated either upon target contact or remotely via non-contact sensors. The vacuum-packed warhead significantly enhances the explosive effect. The missile's homing warhead boasts ultra-wide viewing angles of plus 60 degrees, can identify and lock onto a target from a distance of 50 kilometers, and is highly resistant to enemy radar jamming. By comparison, the American Harpoon anti-ship missile has less robust characteristics, with viewing angles of plus 45 degrees. Thanks to the effective deployment of these two missiles, the missile cruiser Moskva was sunk. Following these events, Russia's diminishing capabilities became evident. The loss of the Moskva marked the most significant military setback for Russia in the war with Ukraine, given its residual value of $750 million. Beyond the financial and reputational losses, the Russian fleet also suffered strategic and tactical setbacks. After the sinking of the Moskva, which served as the air defense umbrella, five to six Russian ships in the Black Sea withdrew from the Ukrainian coast. Imagine how they felt. In early May 2022, Russia attempted to fortify the vulnerable garrison stationed on the captured Ukrainian island of Zmini. However, after the loss of the Moskva and the retreat of the Russian fleet to Crimea, protecting Russian supply ships in the western part of the Black Sea became increasingly challenging. This vessel symbolized Russia's Black Sea fleet and was among the best in its class. Boasting an impressive tonnage to armament ratio, its primary mission involved engaging carrier groups, frigates, and cruisers using 16 Vulcan cruise missiles. The ship featured a fort or S-300 air defense system battery, torpedoes, and helicopters. The Moskva played a pivotal role in establishing an air defense umbrella through air target detection radar stations and missile systems. Other Russian ships in the naval group relied on the flagship's cover as they lacked robust means of detecting and destroying targets. The absence of the cruiser at sea soon had significant repercussions. On May 2nd, two Russian patrol boats of Project 03160, Raptor, and the landing ship of Project 11770, Cerna, were struck by TB2 Bayraktar drones near Snake Island. On May 5th, a Russian frigate of Project 11356R type Petrel caught fire near the Ukrainian island of Zmini in the Black Sea, presumably after being hit by a Neptune missile. On May 7th, near Zmini Island in the Black Sea, Ukrainian defenders destroyed a Russian Cerna-type boat. On June 17th, in the vicinity of the island, the Ukrainian Navy launched two Harpoon missiles, targeting the tugboat Lifeguard Vasil Bek. Although it was not sunk, the ship had to be towed to Sevastopol. Isolated from supplies and unable to sustain its defense of the island, the Russian garrison evacuated Zmini on June 30th. With the loss of cruiser Moskva, along with its long-range missiles and the relinquishing of control over Zmini Island, the Russian Black Sea Fleet's ability to deploy significant Russian amphibious forces and protect them against air and missile attacks was compromised. This means what? That Russia can no longer establish a coastal front along the western Ukrainian coast for an assault on the port of Odessa, which remains Ukraine's primary strategic maritime outlet. Prior to the effective use of anti-ship systems like Neptune and Harpoon, Russian ships would approach the coast from a distance of 18 to 25 miles and unleash artillery fire with impunity. The introduction of these weapons significantly altered Russia's tactics, as ships started to maintain a closer proximity to the Crimean Peninsula, avoiding any approach within 100 kilometers of the coastline under Ukrainian control. Both missile systems have an estimated range of approximately 174 miles when fired from the shore, covering nearly the entire northwestern portion of the Black Sea, but falling short of reaching the Russian Navy's base in Sevastopol. 
Following the acquisition of Grim-2 missiles by the Ukrainian armed forces, capable of covering a distance of 310 miles on a quasi-ballistic trajectory, and two naval drone attacks on the main base in Sevastopol, Russian missile carriers now venture to sea only when accompanied by boats, taking refuge near the southern coast of Crimea. Speaking of naval drones, they've been an absolute game-changer, altering not only the course of the Russo-Ukraine conflict, but also the landscape of modern warfare itself, and it is primarily Ukraine that deserves the credit for this monumental development. Naval drones have emerged as a notable innovation in this war. In the Black Sea, Ukraine has ushered in a new era of naval warfare with the use of suicide sea drones, armed with explosives designed to ram into targets and detonate upon impact. Scott Savitz, a senior analyst at the RAND Corporation, commented that Ukraine has employed these explosive uncrewed surface vessels, USVs, as formidable weapons against Russian fleets and even infrastructure. Savitz's analysis highlights that seafaring drones possess a unique capability to carry substantial explosive payloads and strike at the waterline of ships, rendering them more dangerous than aerial weapons like missiles and bombs. Furthermore, their relatively low cost allows Ukraine to execute attacks with a large number of drones, making them difficult to detect by Russian warships despite their scale. Ukraine initially employed sea drones in a significant attack in October 2022, targeting Russia's naval base in Sevastopol. Following this, Ukraine developed more sophisticated drones capable of carrying larger explosive payloads. In recent months, Ukrainian sea drones have successfully targeted a Russian warship near a naval port and a Russian oil tanker. Each drone costs only about $250,000, yet it has the potential to inflict damage on or destroy multi-million dollar Russian vessels. As these drones are relatively new, they are compelling Russia to develop advanced defenses against them. How can Russia respond to such innovation? It needs to allocate additional resources to protect its ships, ports and bridges, safeguarding its economy and troop resupply capability. These sea drones exemplify Ukraine's ingenuity in outsmarting a more powerful and better armed adversary. Throughout history, wars have often spurred innovations in naval technology. The American Civil War witnessed the debut of ironclad warships, while World War I introduced widespread submarine warfare. World War II demonstrated the superiority of aircraft carriers over battleships. The Russian-Ukrainian war showed how good the naval drones were. However, drones are better suited for attacking stationary targets such as ports, ships at anchor, and hydraulic structures. Targeting fast and maneuverable ships presents greater challenges, requiring constant location updates, and although 154 pounds of explosives might damage a corvette or frigate, it's unlikely to destroy them. So, Ukraine started to develop more advanced drones. Civilian vessels loaded with military equipment make more effective targets, as they are slower and typically follow predictable routes. Instances of attacks on warships in the open sea have also been reported. You can't even imagine what a success that was. In May 2023, drones struck the Russian reconnaissance ship Ivan Kurs. On the night of July 25th, the Russian Ministry of Defense reported an attempted attack on the patrol ship Sergei Kotov which was believed to have been dispatched by the Russians to intercept civilian vessels. Some drones have the range to project force across the entire Black Sea. In November, they targeted the oil terminal at Novorossiysk, which was only 546 yards from the submarine parking area, as noted by naval expert Volodymyr Zablotsky of Defense Express. He emphasized that the Black Sea lacks safe havens for the enemy. Currently, Ukraine is developing and using various models of maritime drones. We'll tell you about some of them. The new underwater drone, Marichka, which passes the first tests. The drone is designed to attack surface and underwater targets, bridges, and coastal fortifications. If necessary, an unmanned ship can transport cargo, for which it is equipped with several compartments, or engage in reconnaissance. Length, 6.56 yards. Width, 1.09 yards. Range, 621 miles. Price, about $400,000. Another drone is the Magura V5 surface drone. Length 6 yards, width 1.64 yards, height above the waterline 0.54 yards, cruising speed 22 knots, 25.28 miles per hour, maximum speed 42 knots, 48.5 miles an hour, range 517.6 miles, and payload 705 pounds. Magura V5 is controlled via satellite or radio. The marine drone is equipped with a video camera and broadcasts video from it online. The drone is multifunctional, 
In addition to hitting targets, it can carry out reconnaissance, surveillance, patrolling, security, and demining. Controlling a drone does not require a complex infrastructure. Only a control panel comparable in size to a laptop is required. In addition to the operator, the device is serviced by several other people. Despite the considerable weight, no special construction is required to launch the drone on the water. A special feature of Magura V5 is the ability to work in a swarm of three drones. At the same time, the main one of them has hardware differences. Probably the additional equipment is a signal repeater. The Sea Baby drone is assembled underground at the factory in Ukraine. Payload 992 to 1,874 pounds. Range at least 435 miles. In addition to the Crimean Bridge, the drones successfully destroyed the large amphibious ship Olenogorsky Gorniak and the Russian tanker Sig. Naval drones allow you to effectively disable enemy ships and other targets in and near the water. The armed forces proved effective in sea battles despite the actual absence of a fleet. There are a few enemy ships compared to other types of equipment, so disabling each one is a great achievement. The Russians destroy up to 70% of naval drones, but the remaining 30% cause them significant problems. You know they'll cause it. The cost of the drone and the ship is incomparable. The creation of a separate brigade of naval drones indicates a large number of them are in service. First in world history, Ukraine creates a fleet of maritime drones, which has already compelled the Russians to conceal their ships. President Volodymyr Zelensky announced this development at the International Forum of Defense Industries on September 30, 2023. Currently, there are 134 types of maritime drones worldwide, but most are reconnaissance or training models. Ukrainian drones stand out for their pioneering effectiveness in actual combat operations at sea as a component of full-scale warfare. Although Ukraine's pioneering use of sea drones may not necessarily shift the tide of war, it could have a similar transformative effect. Ukraine's attack on Sevastopol marked the world's first instance of combining sea and aerial drones in warfare. They were also successfully combined with long-range missiles. Drones are a key component of the Ukrainian Mosquito Fleet concept. This is the concept that fast and maneuverable warships can deal significant damage to larger enemy ships, thereby being more effective. Currently, naval drones can serve at least three roles. Demining the coastal zone, conducting maritime reconnaissance, particularly near Crimea, and executing force projection and strike missions. Ultimately, we can say that long-range anti-ship missiles and naval drones force the Russian fleet to retreat as far as possible to those safe zones that still remain. Currently, Ukraine is working on destroying Russian air defense systems, ships near Crimea, and headquarters. Due to the latest tactics, the entire potential of the Russian fleet is being destroyed. Do you think an effective weapon against naval drones will be invented? Or is that an end to the Navy? What do you think will be the war to war in the future? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. On the one hand, we've got Putin, who's managed to maintain his iron control over the population through propaganda and repression, all the while claiming that victory is imminent. He threatens the West with both nuclear and conventional attacks and continues to sacrifice enormous amounts of soldiers and materiel. All the while, Russia's position is deteriorating under the effects of crushing economic sanctions, shrinking war supplies, lack of qualified recruits, and rebellious military contractors. Ukraine is in a slightly better position, as President Volodymyr Zelensky has kept national spirits high and the country continues to receive huge amounts of advanced military supplies from NATO, the US, and other allies. Even so, Russia continues to occupy large parts of eastern Ukraine, and the ongoing Ukrainian counteroffensive has made slow progress in retaking the heavily fortified Russian positions. The progress of Ukraine's armed forces, the AFU, largely depends on continued Western military support and high national morale. But with critical elections in many Western countries coming soon, many people have begun to ask how and when the war will come to an end. Hein Germans, a military historian, expert in territorial conflicts, and University of Rochester professor, recently sat down to discuss the topic on CNN. His interview covered several possible scenarios for the end of the war, and how likely each might be, and just what would be needed for them to actually happen. In this video, we'll go over some of his arguments and dive into what they mean for the coming year. Probably the most important takeaway from German's work is that we shouldn't expect things to wind down anytime soon. He has studied conflicts for decades and concluded that in many cases, wars don't end decisively. 
World Wars I and II are among the rare instances of major conflicts ending with total victories and the unconditional surrender of the defeated. The US Civil War is another prominent example, although in that case the losing side was not even a fully formed country. However, in most conflicts, both warring parties will do anything necessary to avoid a complete loss. This generally means that they change tactics, make some sort of temporary retreat, or continue fighting at a lower level of intensity to try and wear down their opponents. But for the sake of argument, let's first take a look at what a total victory would actually entail for both sides in the Russo-Ukrainian War. A total Russian victory, which now seems incredibly unlikely, was pretty much the standard assumption when the conflict began in 2022. During the first days of Russia's invasion, it was definitely a real possibility. Troops surged across the border, tanks rolled towards Kyiv, and airstrikes rained down across the country. Putin hoped to quickly encircle and take control of the capital, capture, kill, or drive Zelensky into exile, and set up a puppet government before the West could take actions against him. This nearly worked too. A huge initial advance of Russian troops from Belarus took over Kyiv suburbs and pushed forward towards the city center. But thanks to remarkably clever tactics and pure grit, Ukraine was able to stop the offensive and deny Russian troops access to key points. While the war has since turned into a grinding stalemate of trench warfare, Russia did manage to pull off several surges which at times overwhelmed Ukrainian defenders and could have threatened vital positions. The areas Russia has managed to keep occupying, like the towns of Bakhmut and Solodar, have come at a huge cost. Most are now bombed out shells, empty of people, and with little real strategic value to either side. Due to the cost of taking these areas, Russia also does not have the military or economic capabilities to actually overrun other parts of Ukraine. As a result, the total Russian victory that Putin has been promising is likely impossible without some major changes to conditions on the ground. But any path he could take to make these happen would also have some serious problems and consequences. For instance, take Putin's threats of resorting to the nuclear option if the West does not cut off its support for Ukraine. The idea has likely been to force their capitulation by presenting himself as willing to impose such high costs that support for Ukraine is no longer worthwhile. But, at least so far, this just hasn't worked. For one thing, no military planners or experts seriously believe that Putin or his generals are truly insane enough to launch a full nuclear strike on NATO targets, a move that would likely result in mutually assured destruction. This leaves the possibility of a limited or tactical nuclear strike on a target inside Ukraine. But while such an attack would no doubt be incredibly deadly, there is little reason to think that it would force Ukraine or its allies to surrender. Instead, a tactical nuke would probably harden Ukrainian resolve even further and cause the West to send its most powerful weapons to the front. It's also unclear how many of Russia's nuclear weapons are actually still effective. Most are Cold War relics which have been sitting in storage for decades with questionable maintenance. The other glaring issue with using a nuclear strike to force Ukrainian surrender is that detonating even a small nuclear device in Ukraine would risk nuclear fallout blowing back into Russia. The last thing Putin wants is to irradiate his own territory, making this a truly impractical option for actually ending the war. But Germans also emphasizes that Putin does have some other options up his sleeve, even if most of them are long shots. One of these revolves around international support, which has been a serious issue for Russia from the beginning. Most of the world has either committed to supporting Ukraine in some fashion or made an effort to stay out of the conflict entirely. While some national leaders like Brazilian President Lula da Silva have blamed both sides and called for an end to the fighting, very few governments have actually given Russia any real support. Those that have are mostly either Russian puppet governments like Belarus or rogue states such as Iran and North Korea who also oppose the West. These two countries have been supplying Russia with most of its outside weaponry, such as the Iranian Shahed Kamikaze drones, which have been repeatedly used to attack Ukrainian cities and infrastructure. Arms deals like that are the only way for Russia to actually evade sanctions and export bans, but the equipment they provide are not nearly enough to ensure a real victory. This leaves one looming possibility which the West would really like to avoid, China lending its support to Russia's war effort. China's role in the conflict has already proven to be somewhat unique, as Chinese President Xi Jinping has had no issue posing for photos with Putin, who he has called his best and most intimate friend. 
Since the introduction of sanctions last year, China has become by far Russia's most important economic supporter, with trade between the two reaching an all-time high of 190 billion US dollars in 2022. The same year, Russian imports from China increased 13% to $76 billion, and its exports to China increased by 43% to $114 billion. A large part of this is the sale of oil and gas, which have long been Russia's most important economic asset. Some analysts have also argued that China wants Putin to set off an age of conquest, which would form the ideal political backdrop for an invasion of Taiwan. If China did lend its complete support to Putin, there is the possibility that it would make the West nervous enough to push Ukraine's government into some sort of lopsided peace negotiations. However, in many ways, China's support for the invasion is still only superficial. It has not supplied Russia with any lethal weapons, and its government has been vocal that this is not about to change. This is especially true after the 24-hour mutiny of the Russian paramilitary Wagner Group and its chief Yevgeny Prigozhin last month, who is now hiding out in Belarus. The defection seems to have made Xi increasingly nervous about supporting a weakened, unpredictable nuclear state on China's border. As Ryan Haas, a top advisor to Barack Obama on China policy, recently wrote in the New York Times, Mr. Xi cannot afford to abandon Mr. Putin altogether. He has invested too much in the relationship and Russia remains useful to China. But the bromance that has caused so much concern in the West has probably peaked. If Mr. Xi is to achieve his strategic goal of surpassing US strength around the world, he will need to rebalance his foreign policy to account for Mr. Putin's vulnerabilities. That may mean stronger Chinese support for ending a war that has backfired so severely on the Russian leader and a potentially less confrontational Chinese approach toward the United States and Taiwan. Germans makes a similar point. Basically, as Xi and his government have become aware that fully supporting Putin will undermine their own geopolitical agenda, the chances of Chinese involvement to end the war have plummeted. This leaves Putin with pretty limited options for securing a total victory. One possibility is relying on support from two Eastern European countries where Russia still holds some influence. The first of these is Belarus, where Russian troops could potentially mass and attempt another invasion of Kyiv from the north. However, seeing as this strategy already failed back when Russia hadn't lost nearly 50,000 soldiers and half of all its functioning battle tanks, a similar attack now would probably go even worse, since Ukraine is now armed to the teeth with advanced Western weapon systems and training. The other possibility is the involvement of Moldova, Ukraine's small southwestern neighbor. While Moldova's government is not supportive of Putin or his war, Russia has spent years sponsoring a separatist movement in the east of Moldova on the Ukrainian border. This small region known as Transnistria holds a battalion of Russian troops who has so far stayed out of the conflict in Ukraine. But that could change quickly, as Transnistria could easily become another staging ground for Russian troops to launch an offensive in the south. If coordinated with an attack from Belarus, such a pincer movement could prove to be a serious issue for Kyiv, forcing them to defend from two directions. But again, the odds of this strategy leading to a complete Russian victory are pretty slim. If attempted without Chinese weaponry, such an attack would have to take Ukrainian and Western war planners completely by surprise. Considering how effective intelligence has been at detecting Russian troop movements, there is little chance that this would be possible. The attack would also likely have to utilize some elements of asymmetric warfare, like mounting an effective rural insurgency or assassinating key elements in the Ukrainian command structure. Again, this seems like a very remote possibility. Finally, it would require credible threats of mass destruction from Putin in order to deter a counter-strike, something he hasn't been able to pull off so far. All things considered, there is now only a tiny chance that Russia could achieve a total victory in Ukraine, quite the change from a year and a half ago. So what are the alternatives? Well, one slightly less distant possibility is that of a Ukrainian victory. While experts and analysts completely dismiss the chance of Ukraine actually winning the war back when it started, after a few weeks, many began to change their minds. As the tide of battle turned and Russian troops were pushed out of Kyiv and forced back into the east, it became clear that Ukrainians stood a chance of coming out on top. This still seems to be the case, although the path to total victory remains very tough. Considering just how badly Russia has fared on the battlefield as well as its diminishing war supplies, internal defections and weak economy, 
It seems logical that Putin cannot continue forever. Ukraine has become increasingly bold as well, vowing to retake every inch of its territory and even launching drone attacks on Moscow itself. Still, there are several clear obstacles to a Ukrainian victory. First, while Kyiv has gotten enormous amounts of powerful military aid from the West, most of it is ground-based and generally geared towards defensive warfare. NATO countries have so far been quite hesitant about supplying Zelensky with long-range or aerial systems most useful for offense. There remain serious worries about these weapons being used to strike targets inside Russia and thus escalate the conflict further. This does look to be changing some, as it was recently agreed that Ukraine will receive F-16 fighter jets and the training necessary to fly them. Even so, it's unclear whether the jets will actually allow Ukraine to retake occupied territory, as both sides are a long way from maintaining air superiority. Another big issue could be retaking Crimea. In recent months, Ukraine has become increasingly bold about its intentions to target and eventually retake the peninsula. This has come along with strikes on key arms depots and supply routes, signaling that a Ukrainian push to retake Crimea could come before too long. But actually doing this might be quite the challenge. Despite acknowledging that Crimea is Ukrainian, Western governments have been somewhat hesitant to fully back efforts to retake it, fearing that it could be a red line for Putin. Another issue is Russian fortifications. Recently, satellite imagery of Crimea shows a complex web of trenches, mines and dragon's teeth set up around Medvedivka, a small town near the border of mainland Ukraine. The most likely strategy for Ukrainian forces would be to try and break through the land corridor between Crimea and the mainland, heading from Zaporizhia towards Melitopol and the Azov Sea. Doing so could split the Russian forces in two, while cutting off major supply routes into Crimea. Unfortunately, to do so, Ukrainian armor and ground units will have to get through the minefields, anti-tank ditches, dragon's teeth and numerous other hazards, while also taking heavy fire from Russian artillery and drones. All of this means that a lightning offensive to retake the area will be difficult and very bloody. Ukrainian commanders know this and are likely trying to bide their time until more cracks in the Russian defenses begin to show. That brings us to the most likely possibility for how the war in Ukraine ends, that it doesn't, at least not anytime soon. There is a good chance that the conflict becomes a lower intensity simmering conflict, with both sides trying to outlast the other. This type of war of attrition is quite common, especially when neither side has a clear path to victory. It also seems likely that Kyiv could bank on such a conflict going their way, since Russia's international support is probably not increasing much. Ukraine may try to take back towns and cities where it can, forcing Russian troops to fight bitterly for every inch of territory, while whittling away at its troops and supplies a little more every week. With no real way to replace them, such a scenario definitely doesn't favor Russia. At some point, Ukraine may decide that Russian positions have been weakened enough to mount a final offensive on Crimea, or it may act more slowly, maintaining constant pressure and constricting supply lines until things become unsustainable. Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov recently stated that he believed Ukraine can retake its territory by the middle of 2024, but it remains to be seen whether that is actually possible. The scary thing with a war of attrition is that as things get more and more dire, Putin may become desperate enough to do something truly stupid. Even if Ukraine is able to slowly retake all of its territory, Putin still has enough missiles to conceivably keep bombarding the country from across the border. If this is the case, then the only thing that can really stop Putin is him ending up in prison or six feet under, otherwise known as a Russian retirement plan. Unfortunately, even if Putin is removed, there is no guarantee that his successor will be better. Some officials in Russia have been even more vocally pro-war than the man himself, and if they took over, it seems unlikely things would just end. But let's say that Putin or his successor finally sees the light and agrees to enter into negotiations with Kyiv. Some people would think that this would magically turn into a lasting peace, but the truth of the matter is that that is far from certain. According to data from the US Institute for Peace, up to 50% of peace agreements between warring parties break down within five years. Even when both sides know that continuing the war will be incredibly costly, there is a strong incentive to avoid giving concessions to the enemy or show weakness, especially in a brutal winner-takes-all political system such as Russia's. This spoiling effect means that it is difficult to make peace last without an absolute victory for one side and suggests that negotiations between Ukraine and Russia 
wouldn't last very long, even if they managed to agree on terms. Successful peace deals are also very hard to carry out logistically, often involving partition, power sharing, autonomous zones, and other mechanisms which can easily devolve into more violence. In any negotiations, Putin and his supporters would almost certainly demand that some or all of eastern Ukraine remain under Russian control, or at least be politically independent from Kyiv. Considering that Putin still claims all of Russian-speaking Ukraine as his own, that the country's Jewish president is a Nazi, and that Ukraine was never really independent in the first place, the chance of negotiations producing results is not very good. So to sum things up, from the perspective of Germans and many other experts, the most likely way for the war in Ukraine to end is to not really end. Fighting will probably continue for quite a long time, but at a lower intensity of violence than during the first year or two of the war. Trenches and minefields will probably remain in place, and missiles will continue to needlessly kill Ukrainians who just want to live normal lives. And that's one of the biggest tragedies with wars. They are much easier to start than to stop. When Putin let the genie out of the bottle in 2014, and then again in 2022, he created a situation where violence may continue for years to come. Like so many other places, eastern Ukraine will remain a perpetual conflict zone, where nobody is really safe, and things can never truly go back to the way they were. While such a messy ending is far from ideal, as Germans makes clear, it is the most realistic outcome on the horizon. But what do you think? Will the war end in a real victory for one side? Or will this be another example of a simmering conflict with no real end? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. If you've been watching the news recently, it's no secret that things aren't going well for Russian President Vladimir Putin. In fact, according to former CIA chief of Russian operations Steve Hall, Putin's troubles are mounting at breakneck speed, and they might just be enough to break the infamous dictator. In this video, let's take a look at some of Hall's predictions about what might happen in Ukraine and just how much trouble Russia and its leader are really in. To start with, let's consider firepower. It's hard to turn on a TV without seeing something about Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky asking for more ammunition. For instance, there have been multiple high-profile stories about how Ukraine's air defenses are short on missiles, leading some to speculate that Russia's air force would finally gain control of the skies and crush Ukrainian resistance. But the truth was far less ominous. Ukrainians had simply stated that at the current burn rate of ammunition, they might run out in a few months not right away. In much the same way, there have been multiple stories on Ukraine facing shortages of shells for its artillery and other systems like the HIMARS rockets. But what these reports don't capture is that Russia is having the same type of problems, just on a far larger scale. Russian ammunition shortages have become just as severe as those on the Ukrainian side. But unlike Ukraine, Russia does not have the same huge coalition of powerful and well-armed Western allies willing to send it more materiel. Instead, its allies are limited to Iran, Belarus and, reportedly, South Africa, China and a few others. To date, the main advantage Russia has had over Ukraine comes from its Soviet legacy. Modern Russia contains massive stockpiles of Soviet weaponry and equipment, left over from the enormous arms buildups of the Cold War. However, after more than a year of war in Ukraine, that stockpile is closer than ever to being depleted. One sign of this came several months ago, when Ukraine announced that for the first time, it had achieved artillery parity with Russia. Throughout most of the conflict, Russia had fired more than 20 times the shells of Ukraine, but for the first time, they began firing the same volume of shells, substantially leveling the playing field. This was aided by HIMARS strikes and sabotage of ammunition depots far behind Russian lines, so that by early to mid-2023, Ukraine was outfiring Russia 6 to 1. As Hall has noted, I think the pattern that we've seen over this year, the first year of the Ukrainian war, has been the West very slowly, very cautiously. I think probably not to overwhelm Ukrainian logistics capabilities, ramping up the type of weaponry and ammunition that goes with that. The huge shift in firepower had a noticeable effect on Russia's attempted offensive operations. Due to the poor training, planning and leadership of Russian ground troops, most of their operations during the war have been heavily reliant on huge artillery barrages. But once their overwhelming artillery superiority went away, it's probably unsurprising that Russian infantry and tank forces haven't fared very well. 
This is somewhat expected from a military made up of mainly green and poorly trained conscripts, where most of the professional soldiers are more interested in lining their own pockets than defending a homeland. Most of Russia's actual territorial gains since the start of the invasion last year have been achieved by the Wagner Group, a huge private military contractor run by close Putin confidant Yevgeny Prigozhin. Unlike most of the Russian armed forces, the Wagner Group is well-trained and equipped, allowing them to avoid some of the most basic pitfalls like walking into endless ambushes or fighting with no boots. One of the Wagner Group's most successful, yet horrible strategies has been the use of prisoners from Russian detention centers and jails, promising them freedom if they can survive a tour fighting in Ukraine. Leaked documents and phone calls suggest that Prigozhin and Putin never had any intention of letting most of these prisoners back into Russian society. Instead, tactics show that they have used them over and over again in the so-called human wave attacks, which helped Russia retake the devastated city of Bakhmut. Wagner released thousands of these armed prisoners who threw themselves against Ukrainian positions and risked being shot by other Russian troops if they retreated. When the Ukrainians opened their lines and revealed their primary defenses, Wagner's regular units would then begin direct assaults on the weakest points, often expending huge amounts of artillery. This strategy proved to be highly effective, especially for a military with such little emphasis on preserving the lives of its own troops. In Bakhmut and several other locations, Ukraine was eventually pushed back due to this strategy, which resembled Russia's actions during the huge sieges of World War II. But Wagner remains not just reliant on prisoners, but also on the continual influx of supplies from Russia's defense ministry. While the group has purchased a substantial amount of its own equipment over the years, inside Ukraine it has proved to be heavily reliant on Russian resupply to keep up the pressure on Ukraine. This has proved to be a significant weakness, and it could also mean the loss of Bakhmut, and more valuable territory during the Ukrainian counteroffensive taking place this summer. Much of the issue has to do with the way that Russia, and Putin in particular, go about politics. One thing Hall has pointed out is that to keep his firm hold on power, Putin must ensure that none of his direct subordinates are too successful, or run the risk of being overthrown. To do so, he often sets elements of his own government against each other, with advisors and senior military planners competing, often viciously. This applies to Prigozhin too. The man sometimes known as Putin's chef experienced a meteoric rise to his current position. Despite private military contractors technically being against Russian law, Putin allowed Prigozhin to create Wagner, on the condition that the group be firmly loyal to Putin, not the Russian state. This formed the basis for Wagner's various interventions in Africa and the Middle East, where it expanded Putin's military reach enriched Russian business interests and left a trail of atrocities in its wake. Wagner's success launched Prigozhin into Putin's inner circle. This has not gone over well with other top Russian officials, such as Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. Shoigu seems to believe that Prigozhin's ambitions and control over a private military are setting him up as the next head of the Russian military, or as Putin's personal successor. He may have reason to worry about his own job too, as Russia's military prowess under him has been less than stellar. Due to its enormous losses, the country is actually the number one supplier of materiel to Ukraine, having abandoned roughly 500 since the start of its invasion. It has also lost advanced air defense systems and huge amounts of ammo. All this is a very bad look for Shoigu, and has led some to speculate about the reasons why Putin has dismissed multiple of his other top generals but not Shoigu himself. One answer is that he has kept Shoigu in charge of the military because without Putin's support, Shoigu is a goner and he knows it. And like the politically adept Prigozhin, Shoigu is an outsider to the corrupt ladder of Russian politics, having come up through the ranks from essentially nothing. Shoigu thus has few friends in Russia's top echelons and does not pose a real risk to Putin's power and control of the state. Ironically, his rise was also as a logistics officer, where he was able to skim or divert large amounts of money from defense projects. Some US military officials have even referred to him as responsible for dismantling much of Russia's capabilities. Prigozhin has also repeatedly attacked Shoigu for his failures in Ukraine, while at the same time pointing out that Wagner has achieved what he could not in places like Bakhmut. It would be easy for Putin to replace the somewhat unpopular Shoigu with Prigozhin, but doing so would potentially endanger Putin himself. Shoigu has also tried to push back from his position atop the Russian military command. He took credit for the capture of Solodar, a salt mining town which Wagner actually seems to have done most of the fighting for. Prigozhin actually took to social media to refute these claims and bash Shoigu, 
and just as Wagner was about to capture Bakhmut, it happened again. As Wagner troops were only miles from retaking the last of the town, Shoigu pulled their supplies just to hurt his rival. Now Russia's issues with supplies have compromised its entire war effort and become a masterclass in how not to handle logistics. In response to Shoigu's actions in Bakhmut, Prigazin took to social media once again, threatening to pull Wagner troops out of the area entirely, leaving the ineffective Russian military on its own. Obviously, this would have been a disaster and made Ukraine's counteroffensive that much easier. Shoigu, of course, claimed that he was not manipulating supply lines and that Wagner had actually received everything it had been promised. When Prigazin took a stand and declared that he would pull out all Wagner troops from Bakhmut by May 10th, the supplies miraculously started flowing again, only to be reduced just days later. So is this just a petty personal struggle, or are Russia's supply issues really that bad? Well, it appears that things may actually be that disastrous, with personal rivalries like this being just one factor among many. While Russia's artillery and other heavy guns were firing almost non-stop last year, now they sit inactive for days at a time. This has allowed Ukrainian forces more opportunity to respond, and may be one reason why the counter-offensive began now. In Bakhmut, recent reports suggest that Ukraine is now advancing south of the city, along a salient about four miles deep, pushing Russian forces back. In part, this is possible thanks to the issues between Shoigu and Prigazin, and due to the fact that Wagner has been doing the brunt of the fighting, while Russian troops secure its flanks. These flanking troops have been attempting to cut off the city for months by capturing the main supply routes to Ukrainian positions. As Wagner closed in on the city and Ukrainian defenders were pushed back, the flank attacks have increased in frequency and intensity. Even as Wagner troops reportedly ran out of ammunition, it seemed as though Shoigu was content to let them take the losses, while using his troops to secure the area. Ukraine has not given up easily, though. It reinforced defenders around Bakhmut with special forces, who managed to grind the Spring Russian offensive to a halt. Since Wagner was unable to launch major attacks against Ukraine from the center, it has allowed Ukrainian forces to reinforce their flanks and launch the deadly counterattacks, which continue today. Prigazin has once again complained about all this on social media and his outbursts are nearly intense enough to constitute treason against the state. He has claimed that regular Russian forces broke and ran at the first hint of a Ukrainian attack, blaming Shoigu for the current situation. But from Ukrainian sources on the ground, it appears as though many of the troops cutting and running may actually be Wagner units. Such reports seem to have angered Prigazin enough that he has actually lashed out at Putin online, in ways which could be very bad for his health. In a recent broadcast following more losses at Bakhmut, he stated that the happy grandfather thinks that he is good. If he turns out to be right, then God may grant everyone health. But what will the country do, our children, grandchildren, who are the future of Russia, and how can we win this war if, by chance, it turns out that this grandfather is a complete shithead? Putin is frequently referred to as Russia's grandfather, and Prigazin seems to be directly attacking him in a way that no other Russian official has dared to do. Prigazin quickly walked back his attack in later interviews, careful to state that many in Russian leadership could be called grandfather, but most likely the lashing out was a sign that Prigazin is increasingly frustrated with the state of the war effort and blames Putin for the untenable situation. This is also likely to be one of the biggest issues Putin has yet faced, with his two top military leaders essentially sabotaging each other. The Russian offensive in Bakhmut has not been nearly as successful as it should have been. Just as Russia started to make headway against Ukraine, the supply issues and infighting may have doomed them once again. What's more, the actual prospect of victory in Bakhmut is essentially meaningless, as the city has never held any real strategic significance. Its only true value is political and ideological, as Putin sees Bakhmut as a symbol of his invasion's success, and losing it would undermine Russian support for the war effort. And Bakhmut is just one piece of the larger picture. This type of drama is playing out across the battle space in Ukraine, as different factions of the Russian military compete against each other for plunder and political influence. But we should remember that at least some of this insanity is by Putin's design, intended to make sure that no one faction can challenge him for dominance in Russia. And while hundreds of thousands of ordinary Russians have paid with their lives, the constant violence in Ukraine still seems far from the gilded halls of the Kremlin and Putin's vacation palaces. Even so, Putin knows that he has risked a lot in this conflict. As Hall points out, as to whether or not Putin will run out of something, willpower, ammunition, men, that he wants to send into the meat grinder, 
I would be surprised if Putin were to just say, okay, no, this is a big mistake, or I've gone too far, or we don't have enough resources. This is one of the significant problems with this, is where does Putin go from here? If he somehow gives up and surrenders, that's going to have negative implications for him back in Russia, but if he doesn't win, that will too, and it looks like he's not going to win. I'm glad I'm not in Vladimir Putin's position right now because he doesn't have a whole lot of space to work with. And in this latest stage of the war, Putin's troubles are increasing again. This time not even due to the incompetence of his own forces. The issue has to do with Ukraine's increasing access to long-range precision weaponry. Since the beginning of the conflict, Kyiv has been asking the West for more materiel, but they have been slow to materialize. It took months for the HIMARS missile system to be delivered, but once it was, Ukraine gained the ability to strike static targets several dozen miles away with deadly accuracy. And in the time since, the West seems to have become more receptive to handing over increasingly powerful weaponry. One of these is the Army Tactical Missile System, or ATAC-Ms, capable of striking targets up to 190 miles away. If the US decides to give these or other similarly capable weapons to the Ukrainians, it will put many major Russian cities and military installations within striking distance. Similarly, the United Kingdom recently agreed to provide Kyiv with the Storm Shadow cruise missile. With sophisticated stealth capabilities and a range more than twice that of the HIMARS, the Storm Shadow will allow Ukraine to hit targets far behind enemy lines as the counter-offensive ramps up. UK Defence Secretary Ben Wallace confirmed that some of these weapons are already in-country, meaning we will likely start to see their effects soon. The UK has over 900 Storm Shadows in its arsenal, meaning that a sizable number will arrive this summer. While Ukraine's government has vowed not to strike into Russia itself, there are signs that it already is using drone attacks and border incursions. It is a simple reality that Ukraine cannot win the war without destroying at least the Russian bases resupplying the front, and this will almost certainly require strikes inside Russia proper. The same may hold true for F-16s, and other advanced fighter jets. As Hall has stated, remember a few months ago when they said, we're not going to send tanks, so that has shifted. Will this be another thing that shifts? Perhaps some of it will depend on what happens on the ground in the next year. A final element of the war's trajectory is the possibility of more external intervention, some of which might favor Russia. If Ukraine continues striking deeply into Russian territory, some experts have argued that China may soon get involved. Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping remain tacit allies, and China would not like the idea that a smaller neighbor supplied by the West could strike inside its borders. This and the CCP's affinity for fellow authoritarian regimes makes their position something of a question mark. As Hall notes, you know, the Chinese position is really interesting and very complicated. The Chinese have very long-term goals. They want to be the primary superpower economically and militarily within the next 50 years. But by the same token, they share a certain ideology with Russia, and that is that democracies are a threat to them. So how is China going to play a neutral, moderating position in this when it's pretty clear they're coming down on Russia's side? Clearly that helps Russia, so China is walking a really fine tightrope at this point. However, there is also the possibility that China will attempt to stay in Ukraine's good graces in order to offer economic assistance rebuilding the country through loans and development projects. This is the strategy that Xi has taken with his massive Belt and Road project, and if applied to Ukraine, could generate substantial leverage over the West. Hall argues that if China wants a future, it's going to have to have really good economic relations with the West, the EU, the United States, and other developed countries. And a relationship with Russia is mutually exclusive, so if I'm Russia, I'm probably thinking that over the long term, the Chinese are not necessarily going to be on our side. All these considerations will play into how the war changes course in the months ahead. Russia's disorganization under Putin, Ukraine's increasing military assistance from the West, and the potential for more external involvement will all shape how effective the Ukrainian counteroffensive is this summer. They will also determine the long-term prospects for peace, as any potential peace treaty will not emerge until one side is definitively crippled or forced to make concessions by its citizens or allied nations. When the dust finally settles, one thing is clear. Russia and Ukraine will both be changed forever, all due to the greed and ambition of one man, Vladimir Putin. So will Hall's prediction for the war pan out, or will there be another major deciding factor in how things go this summer and beyond? Let us know what you think in the comments below. 
and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Those who say Ukraine's offensive is going too slow almost always have a poor understanding of the nature of modern warfare or lack a real appreciation for the difficulty of reclaiming lost territory. Despite Ukraine's undeniable military competency, they've been unable to push Russian forces out of their territory thus far. But why? At a recent ceremony paying tribute to the memory of fallen Ukrainian soldiers, President Volodymyr Zelensky encouraged optimism and unity, even as an undeniable feeling of solemnity swept over the procession. It was Ukraine's Day of Defenders, and as he reflected on the sacrifices which had saved his country from complete collapse, Zelensky reaffirmed his belief that victory would come. Plenty of pessimistic armchair generals around the world are casting their lots in disagreement of late. With Ukraine's counteroffensive struggling to move the needle, US aid slowing to a trickle, and notoriously pro-Russian candidates winning elections in neighboring countries like Slovakia, optimism has certainly faded. These are tough times for the Ukrainian people. They are in a dogfight for their very lives, and so much of their future is out of their control. Still, we can emphatically stress that despite these setbacks, Ukraine is still winning the war. Sure, there hasn't been a simple or clear path to victory, but nothing in war, as Clausewitz famously said, is easy or simple, especially when you are the underdog. The Ukrainian armed forces have set some incredibly high standards for themselves over the past year. Some argue they are not living up to these standards in light of the equipment and training they've received. In today's video, our military experts explain why that is an unfair claim. Ukrainian forces began laying the foundations of their ongoing military offensive last winter, a period corresponding with a marked decrease in operational tempo as Ukrainian forces absorbed what was, in hindsight, an incredibly poor attempt by Russia to reclaim the initiative. This calculation, to sit back and prepare, was a necessary risk. The fact that Russia visibly struggled to retake the city of Bakhmut in this period reinforces the difficulty of conducting offensive operations against well-entrenched defenders. Ultimately, it cost them over 50,000 soldiers to do so, a staggering number given the fact their objective was largely devoid of strategic or political value. Yes, Ukraine was pushed out of Bakhmut, but they bled Putin dry in the process. With most analysts in agreement that Ukraine inflicted five Russian casualties for every one of their own. In the end, rabid Russian bloggers finally got a tidbit of positive propaganda to send to the folks back home. As one commentator aptly put it, though one could now make the argument that Bakhmut has now the largest reserve of sunflower fertilizer in the world in the wake of the bloody winter of fighting to take it, Russian troops faced significant difficulties attempting to attack during the winter. They were unprepared for offensive action, relying on mercenaries rather than outfitting their own forces with the winter clothing and equipment they needed to thrive on the frozen battlefield. Hypothermia was a big threat for Russian troops as Ukraine's 3D-printed munition-porting drones drifted lazily overhead. You could see many Russian soldiers moving lethargically even as grenades fell into their foxholes, unable to escape the blast, a sign they were already falling victim to the harsh conditions before the threat of imminent death could register. When you can barely keep fresh conscripts warm or fed and struggle to keep vehicles operating at the tail end of your supply lines, maneuver warfare on prepared defensive positions becomes next to impossible. We now know why Russia could barely move the needle last winter. There was no chance Mobix or mercenaries alike would ever be able to conduct meaningful combined arms operations when you factor in the lack of experience for the former and the lack of trust in the latter. So, what was Putin to do? When cruelty supplants logic, you get Russia's shameless human wave attacks. Sending clearly expendable conscripts into the breach in clear view of Ukrainian artillery observers and drones. One Atlantic Council study revealed how, as this offensive tactic became mainstream, catastrophic losses threatened to undermine morale within the ranks of Putin's invading army. It certainly revealed a lack of military options. After a year of embarrassing battlefield setbacks, highlighting the lack of available armored fighting vehicles, which would have at least offered marginally better protection than what most Russians got. That is, if the Russians knew how to employ them properly. All evidence thus far points to the contrary. Case in point, the attempt to take the town of Vuladar around the same time, where Russian forces wrote off 25 main battle tanks to Ukrainian mines and artillery fire. In the pandemonium, Wagner, Patriot PMC, and Russian forces suffered a catastrophic loss of communication. 
which resulted in the destruction of hundreds more armored vehicles. Even Russia knew these types of losses weren't sustainable. Well aware that many Ukrainian forces had been withdrawn into Europe for intensive combined arms training on new Western weapons platforms, they knew they'd have to brace for a coming spring counteroffensive. And so, the Russians did the one thing they were still competent at, using bulldozers and excavators to build an interlocking network of tiered defenses, including miles upon miles of minefields, command bunkers, tank traps, dragon's teeth, barbed wire, and of course, trenches. Each barrier offered multiple fallback trenches, enabling retreating defenders to lure attackers into successive kill zones. Artillery was massed to repel attackers at strategically designated choke points. Helicopters were used to target onrushing Ukrainian AFVs. The best Russian troops were tactically withheld as mobile reserves until Ukraine revealed its true axis of attack. Given as much as a year to prepare in some places, you can imagine how serious these defenses, considered the largest defensive fortification since World War II, actually are. Unsurprisingly, some of Russia's most notable fighting came in the earliest days of Ukraine's current summer counteroffensive. As well-equipped defenders caught initial Ukrainian mechanized convoys in the opening phases of probing these defenses, destroying and damaging many of their new Western vehicles in the process. For the past few months, Russia has been fighting from prepared positions, from which they were fully anticipating Ukrainian counterattacks. Last time the Russians did this in the Donbass, the war stretched on for eight years between 2014 and 2022. Ukraine never veiled its intentions of achieving a breakthrough somewhere along the front at a time and place of their choosing this summer. To succeed, they needed a steady flow of Western aid and supplies, which as both a credit to and an indictment of Western governments they ultimately received, though not on the timetable Ukraine yearned for. Ukraine then needed to ensure their Western benefactors that they could be trusted with this equipment, which meant training on the new platforms to rehearse their intended use cases in eastern Ukraine. As part of this, they had to make sure they could mass the requisite force in reserve to exploit any breakthrough. This introduces another problem Ukraine has been facing. As any good soldier will tell you, there is a 3 to 1 rule at play when you are trying to penetrate a prepared defensive position. You need three times more attackers and equipment to beat an entrenched defender. And that is where Ukraine still struggles. As a far smaller nation with a fraction of the GDP Russia enjoys, uh, once enjoyed, it cannot afford to sustain the incredible human losses Russia apparently barely bats an eye at if it hopes to emerge victorious. The style of fighting Ukraine is trying to become proficient at, Western combined arms warfare, requires both manpower, materiel, professionalism, and technical aptitude. And if Ukraine wantonly throws away its trained forces into the meat grinder, it will take months to train up replacements on newly integrated armored vehicles, counter-battery radars, and engineering vehicles in their stead. As long as they are on the defensive, Russia does not have this problem. The problem they do have is the fact they are still losing about three times as many troops as Ukraine while on the defensive. While they have admittedly knocked out roughly half of the US-delivered Bradley infantry fighting vehicles over the course of the offensive, Another problem is that the vast majority of these vehicles not only survive long enough to be pulled back and repaired, but that contrary to most crews in Russian armored vehicles, the Ukrainian crews survive. CBS News foreign correspondent Holly Williams witnessed this firsthand on a recent tour of the front lines. In an interview with Serhii Gavrilyuk, a Bradley crew member, he mentioned how simply driving the American-made vehicle into combat struck fear into the enemy. It scares them, he said. When we hear their radio and they hear that Bradley coming, they start to run away. Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, ex-commander of the US Army in Europe, said this reaction makes sense. If you go back to the Cold War, the United States realized that if we were in a conflict with the Soviet Union, we were going to be grossly outnumbered. And so the whole concept was fight outnumbered and win. And the only way you can do that is if you've got longer range. You're able to hit a Soviet tank before it even sees you. Yes, that was the logic behind the Bradley's Cold War creation, facing an enemy whose manpower vastly exceeded that of the Americans. Today, the Ukrainian forces operate under the same conditions, which is why the Bradleys have been so critical. Improved survivability offered by Western vehicles enables Ukrainian crews who have been in a firefight to continue fighting in new vehicles, while Russia is forced to inject green conscripts with inadequate training to do the same. Here's another issue. While the Ukrainian front is massive, said to be the distance between Washington DC and Atlanta, it also isn't. In World War II, the Allies had to contend with massive oceans and vast distances. 
when planning their offensive against the Axis. In a way, this played into their hands for a time. Germany, for example, didn't know whether an invasion was coming across the English Channel, down in North Africa, or somewhere else in the Balkans. With no satellites, drones, or high-altitude aerial reconnaissance, it was far easier to veil one's intentions and achieve surprise. The problem with Ukraine's offensive is that their intentions have been telegraphed from the very beginning. If it wants to expel Russia from the east, everyone knows what they have to do. They have to sever the Kerch Bridge supply route into Crimea and sever the overland supply routes into occupied southeastern Ukraine. The first objective would not only boost morale as a serious propaganda victory, it would severely limit Russian offensive capabilities in and beyond Crimea. The Kerch Bridge is the lifeline for all Russian forces in the region. Previous Ukrainian attacks with sea drones and other munitions have caused temporary shutdowns but could not permanently damage the structure. Crimea remains a valuable military asset for Putin. It is essentially an unsinkable aircraft carrier, a base from which he is able to launch cruise missiles, airstrikes, and other ballistic missiles from naval vessels moored at the port of Sevastopol, or if he pleases, rest and resupply frontline forces. Short of permanently destroying the Kerch Bridge and staging an audacious amphibious assault for which Ukraine lacks the requisite materiel, it looks like Crimea will remain in Russian hands for the foreseeable future. The lack of military options here ultimately made it even more likely for Ukraine to target the second alternative, the overland supply routes to southeastern Ukraine. Railway lines along the Sea of Azov have been sustaining Russian defenders for over a year now. They are also responsible for part of the inflow of supplies into Crimea. Ukraine knows that virtually everything south of Mariupol relies on overland supply routes to subsist. So if Ukraine wants to inflict the most damage on Russia's southern war effort, the furthest from its bases in Russian territory, it would need to target the roads coming and going from Mariupol and Melitopol. Several weeks ago, Ukraine confirmed that it had succeeded in breaking the first line of Russian defenses. But looking at any map of Russia's prepared defensive network, you begin to see the scale of the problem. While Russia has proven its utter incompetence in this war, even they know that Ukraine is trying to get to either Mariupol or Melitopol. This is why the current offensive has not achieved the same outcome as the Fall 22 operations in Kharkiv and Kherson, even though it has achieved notable successes in other areas. The Fall 22 offensives had been completely and thoroughly veiled in secrecy. Russia had no idea when and where the breakthrough would come. Conferring with American intelligence officers and other officials, plans were amended to capitalize on Russia's weak ISR capabilities and maximize the momentum which would come. Nobody, not Putin, not anyone outside of a select body of Western and Ukrainian officials, predicted that the first attacks would come at Kharkiv. Reinforcing the Kherson axis where the initial blow did come, Russia and the world soon realized that the true left hook was thrown in the north. The defenses around Kharkiv were weak enough that thousands of onrushing vehicles and soldiers could exploit and overrun them. Uncharacteristically, Russia seems to have learned from this glaring strategic mistake. The current offensive has been significantly less successful than the prior in retaking lost ground. But unlike the 2022 offensive, Russia was not deceived as to where the attack would unfold. Since Ukraine needed time to receive new vehicles and training, Russia made the most of it, virtually fortifying the entire front. Unlike the Kharkiv and Kherson attacks, this time Russia made sure the Ukrainians would have to inch through vast minefields sown with thousands of mines. This time, Russia would engineer a front which would essentially strip Ukraine of the token advantage it had taken into the previous counteroffensive, mobility and combined arms maneuver warfare. Ukraine has had to settle on slowly and methodically taking its objectives, then trying to reclaim territory with wave after wave of human meat shields. Russia has the numbers to do this, but it lacks the will to exploit tactical gains into strategic victories. Most recently on October 9th, it mounted a localized counteroffensive of its own near Avdivka, in the Donetsk Oblast and Orykiv in western Zaporizhia Oblast in an attempt to draw Ukraine away from its gains in the Robotyne area. Three Russian battalions participated, driving forward with convoys of armored vehicles and trucks supported by airstrikes and artillery barrages. The attack went as expected, attempting to encircle Avdivka, one of the most heavily fortified areas of the Donetsk Oblast front line, a task for which military analysts argued would require far more military forces than Russia actually committed. Video surfaced of vast columns of vehicles knocked out by Ukrainian artillery. Limited offensives like these are indicative of two things. One, 
that Putin and his generals sense the importance of pinning down Ukrainian reserves so they cannot penetrate critical areas on the front in the Zaporizhia Oblast, perhaps even a sign that the Ukrainian offensive is still grinding forward, and two, that it has learned that it needs to stage spoiling attacks like these if it's to hope to stop Ukraine altogether. As things stand, Russia is running out of options, according to Colonel Seth Krumrich, vice president at a global security consultancy. If I were Russia today, I would punch, because the Ukrainians are going to find a breach, and they're going to punch through it. Removing pressure on itself by staging limited offensives may be the only way to delay the Ukrainians until winter itself arrives. Ukraine, for its part, has claimed that it may be able to maintain its momentum through the winter. If the cold weather hits immediately, noted Ukraine's Eastern Forces spokesman, the ground will remain frozen and heavy machinery will be able to move on it. Only time will tell whether this is the case or not. With the offensive ongoing now for the better part of four months, it's important to take stock of what it has achieved. First, let us stress that nobody has seen a near-peer conflict between two semi-modern powers in decades, and that nobody, including us, can claim to know exactly how the war will unfold. It is counterproductive to try to put a timetable on Ukraine's armed forces, but they are not going to give up without a fight. Even if the advance along the Robotine axis stagnates, Ukraine will remain committed to what could potentially turn into a decades-long guerrilla war. Even this would not eliminate them from victory contention. Look at what happened to the Russians in Afghanistan. Still, over the past four months, Ukraine has managed to retake half the territory Russia captured earlier this year, pierced Russia's vaunted Sorovkin line of defense, threatened Russian logistics by striking deep into Crimea, and deprived Russia control of the Western Black Sea. These are not insignificant gains. And yet, the expected breakthrough still hasn't materialized, and it's honestly not all that hard to see why. Ukraine spent weeks probing for weaknesses along the front lines, but by the time they were ready to mass and exploit any of them, they discovered that they critically lacked Western mine clearing and engineering support vehicles, which would enable safe passage through the defensive quagmire. To adapt, they had individual soldiers crawling forward with minesweepers under small arms fire, mortars, and artillery rounds to chart the path ahead, with predictably slow results. In addition, nobody expected Russia to recommit its dwindling force of attack helicopters into the midsummer crucible, but this they did, achieving limited successes against the onrushing pockets of Leopard and Bradley fighting vehicles as Ukraine suffered from a lack of mobile air defenses. Still, by mid-August there was visual confirmation of Russia losing its 40th Ka-52, with more losses reported. Russia had inflicted significant damage on Ukraine's advancing columns, but only at a serious cost to its own combat capabilities. This then encouraged Ukraine to change its tactics yet again. Rather than probe enemy defenses in the hopes of throwing their weight at the critical point and causing a complete Russian collapse, they started to focus on the long term. Russian artillery units were accustomed to engaging in artillery duels with enemy troops as their troops advanced. Pretty soon, however, they began noticing the enemy's guns falling silent. Ukrainian gunners only responded when its forces came under Russian artillery fire, and they did so with precision radar and counter-battery fires, specifically targeting and destroying Russian artillery emplacements. This has served to shrink the gap in Russia's biggest advantage of the entire war thus far, its disproportionate quantity of available artillery. Russia remains invested in destroying the ever-elusive HIMARS batteries, wreaking havoc among artillery of their own. With an influx of even more units donated to the Ukrainian armed forces, Russian assets remain almost as vulnerable as they were when the weapon system first arrived on the battlefield. We know this is a critical problem for Russian forces. Last July, they even fired one of their own generals, commander of the 52nd Combined Arms Army, for complaining that the Russian Ministry of Defense was failing its troops. There was, he said, scant reconnaissance or protection for Russian artillery, which proved to be increasingly vulnerable to Ukrainian strikes. The ongoing destruction of Russian artillery remains a core objective for Ukrainian forces. It has and will continue to severely limit Russia's ability to conduct meaningful offensive operations of its own. Add to this the calculated targeting of Russia's high command in Ukraine, and you start to see what they are building at. If they can attrit Russian leadership, destroy expensive air defenses, missiles, radars with small-scale raids, and wreak havoc among Russian artillery batteries, its troops will lose confidence in their leaders, introducing new weaknesses in Russia's ongoing quest to maintain command and control on the battlefield. Yes, Ukraine may not be on the cusp of the breakthrough many Westerners anticipated at the start of last summer, 
but it is far from losing ground. But what do you think? Will this underdog come out on top and over time send Putin's army running for the hills? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. At this point, we're pretty sure that Putin is sticking his head into a paper bag in panic and trying not to hyperventilate on a daily basis. While he has several reasons for doing this, losing thousands of tanks on the battlefield in Ukraine, the ongoing NATO expansion, coup attempts and more, there's another looming threat that he can't seem to escape. Ukraine is equipped with US weapons and Russia can't seem to stop them. But why? Is Putin really that incompetent? What are these weapons and how come Putin can't fight them off? Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine began more than a year ago, the United States has committed more than $45 billion worth of aid to help the country defend its sovereignty. Much of this has taken the form of high-tech, lethal military equipment. The assistance has proven to be critical for Ukraine's battlefield success and a nightmare for Putin and his top military planners. Now 19 months into the conflict, it could make all the difference in Ukraine's slowly growing counteroffensive. So let's take a look at what equipment the US has sent so far. What else might it be planning to send and why Russian troops seem to be so helpless against US exported firepower? Among the most important weapons the US has sent so far to Ukraine is the FGM-148 Javelin, a potent anti-tank guided missile system or ATGM. Jointly manufactured by defense giants Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, the Javelin first entered service in 1996 as a replacement for the older M47 Dragon missile. It has also proven to be one of the most effective pieces of US military aid. Ukraine has received more than 7,000 Javelins since the start of the invasion and has put them to remarkable use. Each Javelin system consists of two parts, the launch tube assembly and the reusable command launch unit, or CLU. The CLU works as the brains of the Javelin and features four times magnification as well as night vision and thermal sights. This allows for independent target verification, meaning small, independent squads can use javelins effectively. Before firing, a 12 times magnification setting allows users to zoom in on a target for identification. To fire, the gunner switches to a seeker FOV mode with 9 times magnification, which is fed into the missile's guidance unit to lock onto a target. One of the javelin's biggest strengths is its trajectory. It features two modes, direct fire and top attack. In top attack mode, its missiles travel in a high arc in order to strike the less armored section of a tank at the top of its turret. Its automatic infrared guidance and fire and forget design also allows the user to seek cover immediately after launch and avoid retaliatory strikes. Javelins can also penetrate even the toughest tank armor as they are fitted with powerful 19-pound tandem warheads. A primary charge penetrates the thick composite armor while a secondary charge follows and detonates inside the tank. However, these features also make javelins expensive at about $200,000 per unit and $78,000 per replacement missile. Money aside, javelins have become a staple of Ukraine's defense throughout the war so far, even being turned into an inspirational internet meme termed Saint Javelin by Ukrainian-Canadian journalist Christian Boris. Even as the invasion shifted into its current brutal back and forth of artillery barrages trench warfare, the Javelin has continued to prove invaluable to Ukrainian forces. Countless videos like this one shared by Yahoo News have shown unsuspecting Russian troops and tank columns rolling into ambushes by Javelin-wielding Ukrainians. As the Javelins are fired, tanks and other armored vehicles can be seen exploding and catching fire. One tank was able to fire before it was struck and immobilized, billowing smoke. At one point in the video, three desperate Russian soldiers can be seen jumping out of a burning vehicle and running away from it. Scenes like this show why the Javelin is among the most effective tools the US has given Ukraine to beat back Russia, but their usefulness has a lot to do with the issues in Russian combat doctrine. Russian tank tactics, which have not evolved much since the 1990s, involve operating tank columns on their own, without the aid of close infantry support. Usually in modern combined arms warfare, Infantry units support tanks by keeping hunter-killer teams away while putting down covering fire and stopping columns from rolling into ambushes. But because Russia operates its armor independently, Ukrainian troops have been able to use javelins and other ATGMs to wreak havoc on unsuspecting tanks. 
The next crucial US weapon which has been utilized in Ukraine are several varieties of kamikaze drones. These have become a serious thorn in Putin's side, giving him a small taste of his own medicine. First is the switchblade. The drone's name comes from the way the spring-loaded wings are folded up inside a tube and flipped out once released. Designed and manufactured by California defense company Avex Aerospace, switchblade drones are light and small enough to fit in a backpack. Launched from a portable two-foot tube, each drone flies to the target area and can loiter, waiting for its target for up to an hour. Once the target approaches, an operator instructs the drone to dive toward enemy personnel and detonate a small grenade-like charge, releasing a shotgun spray of shrapnel in a specific direction. Its loitering nature means that unlike most other weapons, the switchblade can wave off or abort a mission if the situation changes after launch allowing it to engage a secondary target or destroy itself without inflicting casualties or damage to property. Its small size and extended operation time also make it great for destroying entrenched infantry, or even lightly armored vehicles like trucks. Videos like this one, shared on Twitter by open source analyst Abraxas Spa, show Ukrainian operators launching switchblades from city streets before retreating to hidden positions to help guide them. While there are no definitive numbers on targets eliminated with switchblade drones, it seems likely that they have accounted for hundreds of Russian casualties and equipment losses. There are also two varieties of the drone, the 300 and 600 models. The switchblade 300 was widely used by US troops in Afghanistan against the Taliban, but considered less than ideal for the higher intensity warfare in Ukraine. Most of those given to Ukraine appear to be the 600 model, which is much larger and heavier, but has a longer flight time and larger payload, making it ideal for taking out heavy armor or fortified positions. But US military aid extended beyond the switchblade as well. The Pentagon has also given Ukrainian forces a number of Phoenix Ghost drones. These were also developed by AVEX under the US military's Big Safari weapons program meant to rapidly acquire and deploy weapons to meet unexpected threats without relying on new research and development. The US has supplied over 1,000 of these killer drones so far, which have proven to be similarly lethal in the hands of Ukrainian operators. While even the larger switchblades are limited to an hour of loitering, the Phoenix Ghost can hover over an area for up to six hours at a time, making it a much deadlier surprise weapon. It can also conduct both day and nighttime surveillance, thanks to its advanced infrared sensors. But like the switchblade, once a target has been detected and identified, the drone dives downwards and explodes on impact. The primary downside of the Phoenix Ghost drone appears to be its reduced speed, which appears in videos to be roughly half that of the switchblade 600. Even so, Alexei Arostovich, advisor to the Ukrainian president's office, told reporters last year that 580 of such units equals about 350 destroyed targets in the close rear, indicating a roughly 60% success rate. It's unclear how much this has changed, but it seems likely that US-supplied loitering munitions continue to play a big role in Ukraine's ability to strike behind Russian lines. The latest US aid package to Ukraine from July 2023, containing over $1.3 billion of equipment, also reportedly contains hundreds of new switchblades and Phoenix Ghosts. This is especially important since Kyiv acknowledged in May that its forces are losing about 10,000 drones per month during both intelligence gathering and strike activities. Similarly, military experts have said the relatively large losses of troops and slow advance of Ukrainians' recently launched counteroffensive are due primarily to the dense landmines Russian troops have laid in anticipation. That potentially deadly terrain separating defenders from invading forces will therefore make additional drones capable of inflicting precise attacks on distant targets especially useful. But just why is Russia having so much trouble dealing with these US-made drones? The simple answer is that the country hasn't effectively prepared for modern warfare. Despite its pre-invasion claims that its military could take on even the USA, the fact of the matter is that Russian commanders have proven they have no idea how to wage modern, combined arms warfare. By keeping different elements of their forces isolated and working individually, rather than in coordination, everything from Russian armor to supply lines to infantry troops are far more vulnerable than they should be. There's also the small problem that intelligence gathering among different elements of the Russian military is essentially non-existent. Because different Russian officials are constantly out to get each other and competing for power and influence, 
they have a strong incentive to let each other's forces take most of the losses, to try and preserve their own power. Obviously, this doesn't work very well when you're facing a determined and increasingly well-armed enemy like Ukraine. The astronomical Russian casualties after a year and a half of fighting are proof enough that Western smart munitions like the Switchblade and Phoenix Ghost are more than Putin's commanders can handle. The less obvious answer is that while Russia is especially unprepared, very few militaries today are prepared to effectively counter the threat of loitering aerial munitions. Just about any force on the planet, including the US itself, would be hard-pressed to defend against repeated strikes by kamikaze drones. There's simply no way to provide infantry troops with effective protection from them, especially as anti-aircraft guns can almost never hit every drone launched. The best way to defend against something like the Switchblade or Phoenix Ghost are electronic countermeasures, such as EMP pulses, which can knock out the signal of overhead drones. Even so, Russia simply does not have the capabilities to stop their strikes, making these some of the most effective weapons supplied to Ukraine so far. Another critical piece of military hardware that Russia has struggled against is the Stinger missile system. At the start of the war, large numbers of Russian aircraft were operating over Ukraine's airspace, leading to predictions that they would soon establish air superiority. But this wasn't on the cards either. And one main reason is the FIM-92 Stinger missile and its counterparts from around the world given to Ukraine. First entering service in 1981, the Stinger is a man-portable air defense system, or MANPADS, developed by defense giant Raytheon. Russia first encountered these deadly platforms all the way back in 1985, during its invasion of Afghanistan. Back then, the US supplied the Afghan Mujahideen fighters with Stingers, which they put to remarkable use for the next few years. The Stinger hasn't changed much since then. It can engage a target from nearly two and a half miles away, making it perfect for taking out low-flying aircraft and helicopters. The Stinger's missile is 5 feet long and 2.8 inches in diameter. The missile itself weighs 22 pounds, while the missile with its launch tube and integral sight fitted with a grip stock and identification friend or foe IFF antenna weighs approximately 34 pounds. The Stinger uses a smart seeker head able to differentiate between an enemy's exhaust plume and engines, helping it home in on even rapidly moving targets. The warhead itself is roughly 2.3 pounds of HTA-3 explosive, a deadly mix of HMX, TNT, and aluminium powder. This does not make the Stinger any less effective, however, since its targeting system allows it to strike the vulnerable engines of enemy aircraft. To fire the missile, a BCU battery coolant unit is inserted into the grip stock. This device consists of a supply of high-pressure argon gas, which is injected into the seeker to cryogenically cool it to operating temperature and a thermal battery which provides power for target acquisition. A single BCU provides power and coolant for roughly 45 seconds, after which another must be inserted if the missile has not been fired. Guidance to the target is initially achieved through proportional navigation, but once in flight, switches to another mode, which is what allows the missile to avoid exhaust plumes. The answer to why the Stingers have been so effective against Russia this time around again has a lot to do with terrible military doctrine and planning. Russia has long struggled to integrate its use of air power with ground campaigns, something which Ukrainians have been exploiting for more than a year. Because Russia conducted its air sorties independently of ground advances, Ukraine was able to shoot down huge numbers of its low-flying vehicles with stingers and other manpad systems. This was also not helped by Russia's basic lack of precision targeting. Most of its aircraft, especially older models, lack the modern targeting pods found on Western jets meaning they have to dip low to have any hope of precise strikes on enemy positions. This leaves them extremely vulnerable to surface-to-air missiles like the Stinger, especially when they cannot detect where the missiles are coming from. Next, no video about US weapons would be complete without mention of the HIMARS system. This powerful rocket artillery system is one of the crown jewels of US aid to Ukraine, and in recent months, reports suggest they have become increasingly decisive in determining the direction of the war. HIMARS stands for High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, a variety of the MLRS rockets, which have been in use since the 1990s. The HIMARS are considered most effective for attacking stationary targets such as infrastructure and troops in a concentrated area, but their extremely long range means that they can be used from far behind the front lines. 
As Ian Williams, Deputy Director of the Missile Defense Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, has noted, HIMARS is one of the world's most advanced rocket artillery systems. Its range is farther than anything the Ukrainians had, so when that was transferred, they got the ability to strike targets deeper behind the front lines and much more accurately. Other experts largely concur, and many have pointed out that without the use of HIMARS, Ukraine would not have been able to liberate nearly as much territory as it has. HIMARS rockets have been particularly effective in fighting Russia's offensive in Donbass by allowing Ukraine to attack Russian supply and ammunition depots. They were also crucial in forcing Russia to withdraw from Kherson. George Barros, an analyst on the Russia and Ukraine portfolio at the Institute for the Study of War, concluded that that was only possible because the Ukrainians had this extended strike capability to degrade those bridges. Without the HIMARS, I don't think the Ukrainians would have liberated Kherson. And while it's certainly powerful, the HIMARS does not have either the range or payload of its cousin, the M270 MLRS. But what it lacks in range and firepower, the HIMARS more than makes up for in maneuverability. Its concept came about at the end of the Cold War, when it became apparent that the US military would be fighting more low-intensity conflicts in multiple environments. This led the Pentagon to move away from clunky, traditional rocket artillery and towards systems with a lighter footprint. It's this speed and maneuverability which has made the HIMARS so important for Ukraine's war effort. Faced with Russia's overwhelming numbers, Ukraine needed a platform able to rapidly deliver a payload and depart before it could be targeted with enemy counter-battery fire or airstrikes. Traditional artillery would most likely have been blown to bits before it could be moved, have let them launch numerous strikes without substantial retaliation, and once a HIMARS is fired, it usually finds its target. Each of its six GLMRS rockets has a range of 57 miles and is armed with a high-precision warhead. This means it can fire from well outside the range of traditional artillery and still hit its targets within several meters of accuracy. This has enabled Ukraine to strike at highly entrenched Russian positions, targeting their weakest points. HIMARS rockets can also each be set to independent targets or used for repeated strikes on the same area of a fortification. Since Ukraine received its HIMARS, it has used them to take out everything from ammunition depots to command and control centers, managing to slow Russian advances to a crawl. Yet despite devoting large amounts of air power to taking out the missiles, Russia has apparently failed to touch 90% of them, instead losing more and more aircraft to stingers every time it's tried. Part of the reason for this is that in addition to utilizing the HIMARS mobility, Ukraine also created multiple dummies consisting of a generic heavy-duty truck frame, painted green and made to look as though it's carrying missiles. Ukraine has also apparently gotten so good at using HIMARS that it has actually been able to take out stalled tank columns, despite the system's intended use against stationary targets. As of last month, the US has supplied 38 HIMARS to Ukraine, but soon it may need more. Former Ukrainian Marine and captured British fighter Aidan Aslin recently told Newsweek that Russia appears to be hoarding its battlefield resources further away out of HIMARS range. This suggests that the country will soon need more weapons with even greater reach, such as ATAC-Ms or British Storm Shadow missiles. But experts also say the real advantage of sending different long-range missiles lies not in their individual capabilities, but in the numbers. The more missiles Kyiv can get its hands on, the more chances they have to strike Russian targets and the more damage they can do. All of this suggests that while the war shows no signs of stopping soon, Russia remains unable to deal with the superior firepower the US has provided Ukraine. It's not likely to get any better anytime soon either, as Russia continues to run out of resources and trained personnel. But what do you think? Will more US weapons ultimately be what ends the war? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis.